morality, myth, poker, and bad conscience in America. Saturday night at 10 Eastern on Book TV on C-SPAN 2. Sunday on Afterwards, former Pentagon spokeswoman Tori Clark has some advice for politicians and executives. It's from her new book, Lipstick on a Pig, winning in the no-spin era by someone who knows the game. She's interviewed by UPI's Pentagon correspondent, Pamela Hess. Tori Clark and Pamela Hess, next Sunday at 6 and 9 p.m. Eastern on Afterwards on C-SPAN 2. Afterwards is also available as a C-SPAN podcast. A hearing now on proposed rule changes regarding lobbyists, gifts, and travel by House members. The Rules Committee hears from several witnesses, including former Representative Mickey Edwards. This is a little more than three hours. The Rules Committee will come to order. We want to uh, welcome all of our colleagues on the committee back uh, and say that this is uh, the second hearing addressing our proposals to uh, possibly change our rules to increase the transparency and accountability of this institution. As many of you know, a week ago, uh, we delved into a wide range of issues related to lobbying reform itself. We heard from our very distinguished new Clerk of the House, Karen Haas, who talked about uh, how we could uh, improve transparency and exactly what the reporting requirements would be uh, for her office. And we heard from six very talented experts who had a, a wide range of backgrounds and a wide range of views as to how we'd proceed with that issue. I want to uh, express my appreciation to the committee for asking very thoughtful questions and for keeping the focus on solutions for reform. As I've said many times, our aim is to take an exhaustive look at the current rules and regulations, to lay every idea on the table, to seek opinions from members and outside experts, and to move forward with a bipartisan reform package. And I underscore this issue of bipartisanship because I have, from the very outset, when we uh, decided to move ahead with this at the, really the end of last year and early this year, I immediately began reaching out to a number of Democrats in both the House and the Senate, and frankly, have had very good discussions on that. Uh, again, because we've made every effort to reach across party lines, I, I frankly will say that I was very disappointed that the, uh, the ranking member on the Committee on Standards of Official Conduct uh, declined the invitation that I extended to make this hearing a joint hearing. We were actually very enthused about that. Chairman Hastings was enthused about the prospect of doing that. And uh, I think it is um, very unfortunate because the Ethics Committee, the Committee on Standards of Official Conduct, uh, has tremendous expertise on the area of travel and gift rules. And um, we were looking forward to working with them. However, I will say that I'm very happy that we will benefit from the knowledge and expertise of my friend from PASCO, Mr. Hastings, who not only chairs the Ethics Committee, but also serves with great distinction on this committee and is the chairman of a subcommittee here. So without objection, I'd like to insert the uh, exchange of letters that I had uh, with the uh, members of the uh, Standards Committee, and so I'll be entering that into the record. And uh, now the Rules Committee will do its part to keep the momentum for reform going with what I'm sure will be another very productive hearing. I want to welcome our distinguished panel of experts and thank them for taking time to appear before the committee. It's clear that gift and travel rules have been abused by some, no doubt about it. Our job is to make it harder to abuse the rules and easier to hold people accountable. Today, the gift limit stands at $50 per gift and not more than $100 per year from one private source. As we consider making changes to the limits, we will strive to eliminate even the appearance of impropriety without being impractical. As the Speaker said, uh, a member of Congress should be able to accept a baseball cap or a T-shirt from the proud students of a local middle school. They shouldn't be denied that. But the issue of privately funded travel also calls for real yet reasonable reform. Members work in this building, uh, members work in this building, is, their work is very, very important, but it's also essential for members to spend time outside of the Beltway. 
to get a sense of how our legislation is working or not working, and to keep up with old issues and to learn ways to address new issues. And I'm a huge proponent of travel myself, and I'm uh, one who does take advantage of that, and I believe it's a very important part of our job. Many privately funded trips are serious, educational, and very valuable. And as I said, they have been for me, and I know for many of our colleagues in the past. Tragically, some of those trips are not, and we've certainly seen some of those come to the forefront. We need to arrive at reform that allows members to get out from under the Capitol Dome while drawing the line on trivial junkets. Whatever we decide to do on these two issues, we should not be adding caveats and loopholes and exemptions to the current rules. What we need are clear definitions, clear processes, and clear accountability. As we begin today's hearing, I want to reiterate that our overarching reform mission is to uphold the integrity of this great institution. In his first inaugural address, Thomas Jefferson said that the sacred preservation of the public faith is an essential principle of our government. As members of Congress, we are honored and humbled by this responsibility that we have. Unfortunately, recent lobbying scandals have made perfectly clear that actions of a few coupled with a flawed system fell short of preserving the public faith. Now we have a terrific opportunity, Republicans and Democrats alike, to come together so that we can restore the confidence of the American people in this great, great institution. We will uh, not squander that opportunity, I'm convinced. With that, I'm happy to call on my very distinguished colleague, the ranking majority member of the uh, Committee on Rules, my friend from Rochester, Mrs. Slaughter. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you for holding this second hearing. Uh, I'm delighted to have all of you here this morning. It's a pleasure to see you, and so nice to see my colleague, Mickey Edwards. Uh, I want to thank the panel of witnesses and uh, the years of study and reflection that you bring with you on the subject of congressional ethics. Uh, I know that your expert testimony will help us move this Congress forward. I said last week that this was a time in history that greatly troubled me. Uh, it's a time in when the words corruption in Congress have become to be one and the same in the minds of many of the citizens that we serve. We didn't do a lot of quoting of Thomas Jefferson here of late, and I, I'm going to continue it. More than two centuries ago, <laughs> he did set down a wonderful path for us to follow. One of our nation's greatest statesmen, Thomas Jefferson, laid out the rules for this body that promoted a political process defined not by corruption, but by reason and the pursuit of the public good. We now know that our Congress has deviated from this wise path, and we need to find our way back. Influential lobbyists, along with the receptive congressional clients, have shut millions of Americans out of the political process that they were meant to control. And sadly, I feel that they have undermined democracy itself here in Congress. And in doing so, they have abandoned the traditions and fundamental principles of this great body and of our nation. The results have been dire. We've seen a strong series of bills that have not had the public interest in mind, but have benefited well-connected corporations and special interests, but not the men, women, and children who count on this Congress to address their needs. We need to usher in a new day here and a new way of doing the people's business. And today, we would discuss an important means of doing just that. In seeking to control the votes of members and contain access to the back rooms where legislation is authored, many lobbyists and private organizations have provided members with trips and gifts free of charge. It's clear that these practices have become far too pervasive and that the opinions of far too many members have been improperly conditioned by them. What we need are common sense rules and standards, vigilantly enforced, and the enforcement is a very important part of it that will prevent such influence peddling from continuing. But we need to tread carefully. We do not, under any circumstances, want to force members to adhere to a set of rules that will unnecessarily separate them from the world outside these halls. Members of Congress need to be able to travel, need to be able to see the world, to experience on the ground realities at home and abroad so that they may better understand the impacts of their decisions. In the same way, none of us want to institute a gift ban. Well, frankly, I believe I do. Since I've written this down, I've written this over again. As I said before, a lobbyist needs to give me nothing more than information. 
I need no food from him or she, her, no gift. Uh, and at the same time, I am required to get comparable information from the opposing view. So I don't want any gift ban. I mean, I do want a gift ban. I do not want anything from the lobbyists. Uh, and then we might not need 63 of them for each of us. What we need is to find the balance between the two extremes, a set of rules that will allow members to be actively engaged with the world and not permit them to be drawn away from it and their responsibilities by unethical influence seekers. I'd like to remind my friends that uh, the Democrats have a plan on the table called the Honest Leadership and Open Government Act, which will address many of these concerns. And we hope to work with our colleagues to refine and pass these democratic reforms. But Mr. Chairman, nothing is more important than to bring back the integrity of our political process. And I said last week in the very foundation from which every law, every act, and every proclamation springs, if the process is broken, and our legislation will be also, and people will suffer as a result. This body should be moved by the strength of our ideas, not just by the strength of our numbers, or by the size of the bank accounts wielded by special interests. We owe the American people a better government than the one we have today. We owe them the democracy that we teach our children to believe in and that defines us as a people. I look forward to hearing from the testimony from our experts and a brighter future for our Congress. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much, Mrs. Slaughter, for your very thoughtful remarks. Let's uh, jump in uh, and proceed with uh, now hearing from our experts. I'll introduce the panel, and then we'll just go ad seriatim as, uh, as you're seated there. Uh, our distinguished former colleague, Mickey Edwards, uh, served from the 96th to the 102nd Congresses. He's director of the Aspen Institute, Rodell Fellowships in Public Leadership, and lecturer of public and international affairs at the Woodrow Wilson School at Princeton University. Robert Bauer is the uh, Farmwood Chair of Political Law Practice at Perkins Cole. Uh, Mr. William Duroff is Vice President for Public Policy and Director of the Washington Office for United Jewish Communities. Michael Frank is Vice President for Government Relations of the F Heritage Foundation. And Robert Hines, Principal of Colling Murphy, Swift, Hines, and former Minority Counsel for the House Rules Committee. So, gentlemen, thank you all very much for being here. Thank you for uh, putting the time and effort into uh, your testimony. And uh, we look forward to hearing from you. So please proceed, Mr. Bauer. And you might want to take that microphone over there so our wonderful C-SPAN audience will be able to uh, hear you as well as Mr. Gingry, who's uh... Uh, Thank you, uh, <clears throat> uh, Mr. Chairman and the ranking member and members of the committee. I appreciate the invitation to testify. I'll be brief. I've submitted written testimony and Without objection, all of your statements Appreciate it. So rather than simply reread all of that and take up more time than necessary, let me just hit on the highlights. One of the questions the committee has raised, and I think it's a foundation question, is uh, has lobbying changed? How should we see lobbying? I think it's important periodically in the current environment to enter a exculpatory word on behalf of lobbying. Uh, very frequently it's used in a prejudicial context, and the suggestion is that people who come to Capitol Hill come here uh, for nefarious purposes, uh, really essentially trying to agitate against the public interest and purely for private interests. But the truth of the matter is that in the years that I've observed lobbying, and that's now 30 in this community, many lobbyists come here uh, not with gifts but with information, with analysis, with a desire to help members understand a point of view they would like very much to have prevail, uh, but their purpose is honorable and their techniques are increasingly professional. So I thought that was an important setting for the discussion to take place here. The second question is, what is the current situation with the rules that the House has? Well, the rules that the cur House currently has in place are, in fact, in many respects, quite stringent. While it is true that gifts up to a modest dollar amount are allowed per source and per, per calendar year from that source, it is also true uh, that in many other respects, the rules call on members on each occasion that a gift might be offered on each occasion that a gift might be offered within the rules, the rules call upon the members to take care that the gifts are not accepted in circumstances that give rise to an inappropriate appearance that could reflect poorly on the institution. And so the rules in that respect are quite stringent. They call on members to make case-by-case, gift-by-gift determinations about whether in the particular circumstances a gift would be properly accepted. In that respect, therefore, not only do the particular rules and the exceptions that those rules provide warrant attention, but also the broader responsibility of members 
in thinking about what they're doing on a day-to-day -day basis uh, to take care with the uh, appearances that reflect on the House of Representatives. So I don't think the problem lies, frankly, in the structure of the rules. I do think, of course, individual rules could be simplified. It, certainly members in their discretion as they reflect on it may wish to change particular rules to make the possibility of evasion less likely, to tighten those rules, if you will, against evasion. But fundamentally, overall, the structure of the rules, not speaking now of any particular one, provide ample protection uh, when members exercise their best judgment ample protection for the institution's reputation and for the public perception of an institution that is in fact deciding governmental issues on the merits. A great deal of attention has been devoted to the question of travel and the expenses paid for travel. In my experience, and again, I'm speaking here as an attorney in private practice, many of these proposals for travel come from institutions that have legitimate reasons to have members visit and participate in programs and inspect facilities. And in fact, the visits come off without anything approaching uh, impropriety with a very full communication and exchange of views between both sides, the private party and the member, and the member the better off for it. It would be a mistake, it seems to me, and very difficult to explain if we tried to so narrow the allowance for members to travel that it was permitted merely for the benefit of educational institutions. Uh, very often, and I see that the Aspen Institute is rep uh, represented today, the Aspen Institute is cited as an example of the kind of institutions that perhaps under a narrowed rule might be able to sponsor member travel. The Aspen Institution is an extraordinarily distinguished one and that sort of travel uh, should be permitted. Those sorts of participations at private expense ought to be permitted. But I think we should take care not to give the public the impression that members do well uh, simply to, if you will, take information in the company of experts and not hear from people, say, at plant sites or private facilities in the country at large. Uh, last but not least, there are a few uh, simple, I think, adjustments that might be considered to improve the clarity of the rules and to improve enforcement. One of them is that the committee really ought to consider whether or not there is adequate understanding of the broad prohibition on the solicitation of gifts. One of the largest problems that I've observed in my practice is the solicitation of gifts and confusion about whether in fact gifts may be solicited even if the gifts otherwise qualify for an exception. There is ample law, if you will, in this institution on the subject. I'm not sure it's clearly understood and that is perhaps a good occasion here, this occasion, to address that. Travel expenses, it seems to me, under the conception that I've outlined, might be one submitted for prior approval. There have been proposals to that effect. I think an approval process for travel is an effective one for two reasons. Number one, it provides the public with the impression of a process for the thoroughgoing deliberation on any proposed trip, but it also helps to focus members on the questions they should be asking themselves when considering an invitation to travel at private expense. Thirdly, training speaks for itself. Fourth, disclosure which nowadays can be affected very quickly and very effectively through uh, web technology. And finally, uh, to the extent that there is confusion in the rules, it's possibly a function of lack of simplicity. And simplification is certainly something the committee might consider as it reviews the rules and determines how to make them clearer and therefore more easily enforceable. Thank you, Mr. Thank Chair. You very much. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Ranking Member Slaughter, members of the committee. Uh, I know our statements have been entered into the record. I'd also like to uh, request that a letter from the American Jewish Committee also be. Without objection, a letter will be included in the record. Thank you, sir. I'd like to thank you for uh, including the United Jewish Communities in this event. Uh, the United Jewish Communities is the national umbrella organization of North America's Jewish federations. We represent over 155 federations, as well as 400 independent communities, uh, Jewish communities across the United States. Uh, we provide needed domestic uh, social services here in the country as well as in Israel uh, and in over 60 countries across the world. The focus of my testimony this morning will be on the legislative proposals to ban uh, or severely limit privately funded congressional travel. Uh, we believe that there uh, is a great deal of uh, value that flows from these educational experiences for members of Congress and for their staff. Uh, some of the issues uh, whether it's uh, political instability in the Middle East, the devastation uh, of our Gulf Coast region, the state-of-the-art uh, nuclear facilities and its corresponding security, uh, or the quality of the continuum of care of our nation's elderly 
are best experienced in person and outside the Beltway. Uh, the experience that members of Congress and their staff receive by seeing uh, these in person, up close and personal, uh, in a multidimensional uh, way uh, is something that cannot be replicated uh, by reading through uh, CRS reports uh, or even by watching uh, on C-SPAN. Uh, we believe that, uh, that uh, this is an essential way for members of Congress and their staffs uh, to better educate themselves on the critical issues of our day. Denying these travel opportunities would have a profoundly negative impact on American policy, uh, public policy making uh, and on the public interest. Uh, as you know, few members of Congress uh, are able to participate in CODELs, particularly those who are not on the relevant uh, uh, committees, uh, and we believe that uh, privately financed travel uh, allows for these members of Congress to learn more about the, the critical issues. Uh, the idea that uh, there will be a, an increase in uh, publicly financed congressional travel uh, in tight budgetary times, I believe, is not something that we can count on uh, to continue uh, these sorts of programs. Uh, additionally, we are concerned about uh, the proposals that are out there for a moratorium on travel. We believe that that would be uh, unwise to have a moratorium on privately financed travel. We can talk more about that uh, in the Q&A if you desire. Uh, we are interested in this travel issue because in addition to trips that are sponsored by our Jewish federations across the country and our community relations councils, uh, our partner organizations in the Jewish community such as the American Israel Public Affairs Committee, uh, represented today by Jeff Coleman uh, behind me. Uh, and the American Jewish Committee uh, with, uh, through their uh, affiliated organizations plan literally hundreds of trips uh, to the Middle East uh, for members of Congress and their staff, as well as to other parts of the world, to Europe, to the former Soviet Union, uh, and to South America, uh, to provide a, a variety of trips for members of Congress. Uh, some of the reported travel uh, that is the backdrop for these proposals for a ban focused on travel where lobbyists have uh, paid for trips with no uh, or little apparent educational value, uh, lavish meals, uh, excellent golf courses, uh, beach resorts, uh, and the like. Uh, we understand and agree with this public backlash uh, on these so-called junkets, but we believe that uh, banning all privately funded trips uh, is absolutely the wrong solution to this problem. I'd like to contrast for a moment uh, these sort of trips that we've read about uh, with the type of trips uh, that our community is involved with. Uh, for instance, the American Israel Education Foundation uh, brings members of Congress uh, and staff to Israel. Uh, trip organizers plan scrupulously uh, working within congressional uh, regulations uh, to ensure that uh, standards are met. Uh, they bring members of Congress uh, to meet with, uh, with policymakers, to meet with leaders, to meet with folks uh, in Israel on, uh, on all sides of the political debate, both within the, the uh, Jewish community as well as within the Arab community. They, uh, the members and, uh, and staff who participate in these trips see firsthand the threats of terrorism, proliferation, uh, and the political and religious extremism, and learn how the United States and Israel work together in meeting these challenges. Hundreds of members of Congress and staff have participated in these sorts of trips and have had the chance to engage in these in-depth discussions. Given the centrality of the Middle East to U.S. national security uh, interests, this type of unique educational experience helps to ensure that American policymakers are well informed when making these crucial policy decisions. Sponsoring organizations have an obligation to make clear that they will fully abide by the established rules and provide members' offices and the relevant committees with all the pertinent information related to the trip. Uh, in my written testimony is some information that goes through the specifics of how one of those organizations, the AIEF, uh, abides by this. In terms of these kind of trips to Israel, members are able to immediately translate their educational experiences into better informed and more critical, uh, into becoming better informed and more critical policy makers at a time when the greatest dangers facing our nation, proliferation, terrorism, and the spread of religious and political extremism emanate from the Middle East, Congress and the public interest are better served by having the chance to participate in such trips. Now, these are not just foreign trips uh, that our community is engaged in. We are also engaged in domestic trips. For instance, last summer, the Jewish Community Federation of Metropolitan Chicago sponsored a trip with 10, member, 10 staff members uh, from the Illinois delegation who spent two days in Chicago looking at the social service agencies that uh, the Jewish Federation and the Jewish community in Chicago support, going into the, uh, the Jewish hospital, going into nursing homes, going into uh, elderly uh, care centers, uh, see, going into our uh, naturally occur occurring retirement communities, our NORCs, which many of you support in your own communities, and seeing them firsthand. Uh, this is an, an opportunity to show staff uh, the linkages between the work that they do on Capitol Hill as well as the model services 
paid for by a combination of public funds and, and private philanthropy. Now, the UJC believes that reforms should be, uh, are needed, but we believe in smart reforms. We believe that uh, they should be targeted at those who are abusing the system. Rather than eliminating such trips, higher standards should be established for educational trips by bona fide 501c3 organizations to ensure the members are participating in legitimate fact-finding missions. Congress can reform the rules to require increased over oversight and disclosure of private trips, both before, after, and pre and post review of approval of trips and trip itineraries. For instance, the current bill before the Senate, which is being debated on the Senate floor, is one which we believe uh, looks at this situation uh, well, and we uh, support that bill. We do believe that current rules are appropriate. Trips should be directly related to a member or staff member's official duties. They should have minimal or incidental recreational or, ent or entertainment component, and they should be designed to influence particular pieces of legislation, but not uh, they should not be designed to influence particular pieces of legislation, but rather to open up new facts, ideas, and experiences for members related to critical policy issues. There are also some proposals that have been uh, put out there that would preclude affiliated organizations, those that uh, are affiliated with organizations that have uh, lobbyists. Uh, we believe that that would be unwise, uh, and we'll be happy to uh, discuss that as well in the Q&A. While it's necessary to prevent abusive lobbying practice, appropriate education and advocacy techniques should not be made illegal. Eliminating privately funded domestic and inter international travel would deny members and staff valuable educational and experiential opportunities, which they are unable to, to receive here in Washington or in their districts. A total ban uh, would deny them valuable resources to gain greater knowledge and understanding of the range of issues that they must address. Foreign travel is essential in this era of globalization. It is critical for members to personally see developments on the ground in other countries. Insularity and isolation cannot be an option for the world's only superpower. Please don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. We urge you to support smart reform. And again, our mantra is we believe in transparency and accountability, which can be brought about through pre-approval, full disclosure, and post-review. Thank you, sir. Mr. Edwards. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I think the last time I was before this committee uh, was as a supplicant asking uh, Chairman Pepper uh, and the committee uh, for permission to offer an amendment, uh, which... Uh, Some things never change. They, that's <laughs> absolutely true. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, uh, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, thank you for uh, inviting me to join you this morning. Uh, I think you face a very difficult balancing act because a functioning democracy depends on public confidence in the integrity of those members of the community who've been uh, selected to exercise political leadership, not just exercising uh, good integrity, but the public believing that you're doing that. The British scholar Bernard Crick once observed that politics is the way a free people govern themselves. Politics, particularly American politics, is an honorable, even a noble calling in a system of separated powers uh, such as ours. And in that case, it's especially important that the public retain confidence in the Congress, which is the branch of government properly known as the People's Branch, and in my opinion, constitutionally, the most important branch of government. At the moment, the actions of a very few people have caused that confidence to be shaken. And you've properly determined that it's your duty to repair any failings in the rules and procedures of the House that lead to an insufficient ability to protect the integrity of this institution and to provide the reassurance that a democracy requires. At the same time, it is important, vitally important, not to react to the misconduct of a few in ways that inadvertently do harm to members of this House and to the institution uh, itself. Because I've had the privilege and honor of sitting where you sit and knowing what your days and your weeks are like. Uh, the travel back and forth between Washington and your districts, the travel within the districts, the committee meetings, the staff meetings, the constituent meetings, the speeches to prepare for, the dear colleagues to read, the bills to understand. I know how easy it is to become overwhelmed to the point that one simply loses the ability to step back and think and reflect and remember the underlying values and principles uh, that brought you to this place. In fact, the program that I run for the Aspen Institute doesn't deal with particular issues before the Congress or the public. Uh, it deals with Aristotle and Locke 
and Rousseau and Hobbes and going back to talking about the basic values and principles and ethics and responsibilities uh, of public leadership. So I know that caught up in this whirlwind that you all are in, uh, insufficiently appreciated by the public, it's very easy to become insular and isolated. Government in that case, and I've seen it and many people have seen it, government becomes reduced from three branches to two parties. And even for those so inclined, there is little time to get to know somebody across the aisle other than as somebody who stands in the way of you holding a chairmanship or shaping uh, the political agenda. And those are kinds of problems that harm the ability of you as our representatives to serve the public good thoughtfully and well. But there has existed, and existed back in my own time in Congress, means for members of this body to get away, to be able to get better understandings of important issues in a way that includes not only knowledge, but reflection. And it allows members to get to know each other as people with whom one can talk and reason and seek for areas of common ground. When I was in the House, I was able to be able to participate in an Aspen Institute program on U.S.-Soviet relations, not the program I run now, but a different Aspen program. And in that program, I had the opportunity to talk to experts and scholars from all over the world, not in a hearing room, but in ongoing discussion, sitting around a table, over lunch, during coffee breaks, and time to think about what I was learning. I was able to learn alongside people I might not have had otherwise the opportunity to come to know. Those who remember me as a member of Congress know that I was considered fairly conservative. When I was elected to the Republican leadership, I was elected uh, as a conservative, uh, as chairman of the House Republican uh, Policy Committee. I was also at that time the ranking Republican member of the subcommittee on foreign operations, and my chairman of that subcommittee was somebody who probably has never had a conservative thought in his entire life, uh, with whom I never agreed about anything, that's David Obey. But as those, pro as those programs developed, I came to know Dave Obey as a person, to know his wife and his children, to listen to them perform. I don't know if you know it, but they're actually quite talented uh, musicians. Uh, I didn't become a liberal, Dave did not become a conservative, but we developed an ability to talk to each other and to listen to each other and to actually hear each other as human beings because we were both interested in the welfare of the country and its citizens. On the advisory committee of this leadership program I now run, sit people like Sam Nunn and Gary Harding, Dick Luger and Al Simpson from the other body, who I never would have known as well if not for those seminars. Some would argue that if these programs are indeed beneficial, and hundreds of members of Congress have found them to be so, they should be paid for out of the public treasury, by the taxpayers, by your constituents. But the fact is, the taxpayers, your constituents, are not likely to prefer to have their tax money spent that way, and the result will be that those seminars will, will not happen, and the benefits that would be gained from this reflection will not happen. The bottom line is this, by being able to travel in such company, funded privately, otherwise it would not have happened, I became a better <coughs> member of Congress, I think, better informed, more thoughtful, better able to work effectively across the aisle. Those events were not paid for by lobbyists, there were no lobbyists present with the program I run with the Aspen Institute, is not paid for by lobbyists, there are no lobbyists present. So the answer to the problem, I think, is not complicated simply prohibit members of Congress from having gifts or traveling to events that are paid for by people who are trying to influence their votes and prohibit people who are trying to influence their votes from traveling with them. Require the Ethics Committee to approve those programs in advance and require members to publicly report their participation. Simply separate travel from lobbying. That's all you need to do. Thank you for allowing me to share the thoughts. Thank you very Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, thank you to the members of the committee for the invitation. <clears throat> the Heritage Foundation's uh, primary target audience is sitting right here. It's members of Congress and, and the staff. And all, all that we do ultimately is designed to bring our research and our ideas to this audience. And a lot of the best way, times we find the best way to do that would be through these kinds of um, seminars and policy conferences that oftentimes are outside of Washington. We do an awful lot of uh, staff events here on the Hill where we serve bountiful amounts of pizza and Chick-fil-A and that sort of thing as well. 
And we're hoping that none of the proposals that you uh, consider would snuff out that flow of information to, uh, to members and to the staff. Uh, one illustration I'll give you is we do the, uh, every two years, a new member of Congress uh, issue policy orientation. And we do one, the Harvard uh, JFK School hosts one, and the Cong Congressional Research Service hosts one. And what we fear, frankly, is that under uh, some, a proposal to ban all uh, privately sponsored travel, the only new member uh, policy orientation that would survive would be one that was designed by a government agency where the content was designed by federal workers and bureaucrats. And uh, as good as the CRS program is, uh, we think part of the reason why it's good is that there is a sort of a competition. The Harvard program is a little more middle to the left of ours. We're a little more to the right. Uh, and we think a lot of members benefit from attending both. Uh, and the ones who go to CRS feel that they get a good program, but we don't want to end up with a monopoly inadvertently being created uh, where the only kind of travel, the only kind of exposure to these ideas and, and recommendations comes from government-created um, programs. We also host, uh, this past summer, a, a joint program with the Pepperdine uh, School of Public Policy. And it was bipartisan. It was uh, three days of intense uh, scrutiny of entitlements. We had experts from Urban Institute, from Brookings, from the Center for American Progress, as well as uh, AEI and Heritage, speaking to this bipartisan group of members. And that required uh, a lot of attention, a lot of detailed time. And I think if you were to look at the, uh, the program, the agenda, you'd see that it was chock full of very wonky seminars and discussions and very little on the side of recreation. Uh, what I would recommend, echoing the other witnesses on this panel, is to focus on transparency and maybe even go beyond the current level of transparency. And in my testimony, I, I lay out a couple of uh, markers for that, including not only uh, getting the, the trips approved in advance, but also after the trip, uh, having some kind of mechanism where members and staff would confirm that what was actually promised took place. And that there's sort of, if you want to even establish bright lines, you could establish some kind of a, maybe a six hour requirement that there be six hours worth of educational time each of the days of these trips. Uh, when you talk about uh, trips, for example, for site visits, as was discussed earlier, we also feel separately that's important uh, as part of the free flow of information. For example, uh, ANWR is a very big issue every year before Congress, and one would imagine it would be as important for members uh, to go up there and, and be hosted by the Sierra Club as by, say, the American Petroleum Institute. And, not, and to not have the monopoly be residing, say, with just the Department of Energy to design those kinds of trips. So again, it's, the, the tension here is between your legitimate interest in establishing and safeguarding the, uh, even the, against the appearance of impropriety, on the one hand, with uh, having and guaranteeing a free flow of information from as many sources as possible. And I just invite you to look at the rest of the testimony to uh, uh, elaborate a little bit more on the details of that. And I really do associate myself with the remarks that, that preceded me. Thank you. Times. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Oh, I'm sorry. Ah, oh, yes. Is that better? Thank you, Mr. Chairman, uh, Mrs. Slaughter, and members of the committee. Uh, I too, like uh, Mr. Edwards, have been here before, and it's uh, the room is much brighter, uh, and uh, it's very nice to be back. Um, Mr. Chairman, I think it's worth noting that uh, at the outset that uh, the folks who have recently uh, uh, pled guilty and been convicted of uh, violations, uh, it happened under current rules and current laws. I don't think we need to um, uh, make huge and major changes in, uh, in the current system. But I think, uh, obviously, um, I think almost all uh, members certainly uh, want to abide by the rules. The lobbyists do as well. And they, but the public does not, I don't think, have the confidence right now in the system as it is that obviously Congress has got to do something. Um, when Congress has reacted to similar scandals in the past, it has generally crafted rules that are complex, often difficult to understand if you are a law-abiding uh, person and uh, somewhat easy to circum circumvent uh, if you wish to. So, it, so this time, it strikes me that what we might want to do is uh, adopt some solid, simple, effective reform rather than patchwork of well-intended but often unsuccessful changes. In addition to simplicity, 
uh, I suggest a guiding principle. Members of Congress and their staffs are here for one purpose only, the public's business. So what is useful to that business is what the rules ought to be about. For example, the theater, sports events, golf outings, and such have no essential relationship to the public business, nor to gifts. The first suggestion, then, I would make is to just ban gifts and entertainment. Do this simple, clear thing. Get rid of both gifts and entertainment, uh, thus removing the issues that are most likely to cause problems. Travel is different, I believe. I think other members of the, of the panel have indicated as well that travel that is connected to the public business can be very useful. It, is also, it can also be abused, but I believe there are ways to keep even privately funded travel available to members and staffs while reducing the opportunities for abuse. Require that all privately sponsored travel be authorized by the committee with jurisdiction over the business that is to be done on the trip. Committees would be responsible for determining the relevance, value, and validity of any travel paid by outside sources. Committees would be required to file full disclosure of the trip promptly. Members would be, should be required to report their own and their staff's travel on their websites. Now, what about meals, which is uh, always a question? I'd suggest that they not be limited but they should be more openly reported. Remove all restrictions on accepting meals. Watching members, as I have, from both inside the institution and working with them as a lobbyist for NBC for a number of years, I have never known a lunch or a dinner to influence a vote. It does build relationships. It also provides an opportunity for exchange of information, asking questions, etc. Even the priciest meal is not going to change a vote, I don't believe. So rather than complex, complex rules governing meals and how and when they can be uh, received really should not be necessary. I have always believed that the best regulator of public behavior is transparency. If the world knows what someone is doing, they are much less likely to do something that will draw criticism. So I would replace the current restrictions on meals with a straightforward re reporting requirement. At the beginning of each month, a member would be required to list prominently on their official website the meals they or their staffs have accepted. Lobbyists, of course, would have to re report those meals as well. By having the information made available in this way, you accomplish two things. You've got a double check on the activity. It would show up on both the lobby report of the member as well as the lobbyist. Secondly, such an approach leaves discretion to the member. He or she needs to determine what their constituents will accept. Members would use the discretion with the full knowledge that the constituents, uh, the information would be available to both the constituents, the reporters, uh, even their opponents. This is a direct and simple approach, and, I count, and I'm counting here, again, on the discretion and the wise judgment of the member. I would hope what members would not want to avoid dinners or meals. Meals are a traditional and commonplace way to discuss business at all levels in our society, not just on Capitol Hill, but the local automobile dealership talking to his, his uh, suppliers. Business people and women all over the country regularly sit down and discuss business at meals. It seems to me that it is important to have that opportunity continue, and as long as it's fully reported, I think there is not going to be a problem. One last observation. No rules can prevent those determined to break the rules from doing so. Adding new layers of regulation won't change that. People who wish to be dishonest are dishonest. So there needs to be sufficient penalties for violations uh, beyond the mere transparency that I've spoken of. The political damage from, for an example, a formal rebuke on the floor of the body is probably the most strong deterrent one could have. Mr. Chairman, I am happy to respond to any questions. I thank you very much for the opportunity to appear. Thank you very much, Mr. Hines, and thanks to all of you for your uh, very, very interesting remarks, and uh, thanks for the time and effort that you put into, uh, into assembling your statements here uh, for us. Uh, most of the discussion has been on the issue of travel, and uh, I know that that is uh, clearly a hotly debated one, and certainly has been over the past few months. Uh, here in both houses of Congress. 
But I wanted to uh, just raise the issue of gifts, which uh, Mr. Hines uh, touched on. And frankly, when Mrs. Slaughter slightly diverted from her prepared remarks to make the statement that she did about gifts, it, it uh, piqued my interest. And I, I wanted to see if you all have any thoughts on, on the following. I, you were here for all of my uh, opening remarks, but uh, I quoted the speaker who um, referred to the fact that the notion of getting a baseball cap or a t-shirt from your local middle school is something that should not lead to potential imprisonment, I think is uh, sort of the, I don't know that he quite said that, but I think that was the uh, indication that he was headed in. And I think that, and I also in my remarks talked about reasonable when we're when we're dealing with this question. I wondered if you all have uh, any thoughts. Obviously, Mr. Hines has stated his position very clearly uh, on this. Um, you probably want us to all have baseball caps and T-shirts in great numbers, but uh, based on which, as long as we disclose them. But the uh, I, I just wondered if any of you have thoughts on uh, the, the proposal that the speaker and I submitted was the, the notion of taking the gift structure, which, as I said in my opening remarks, is now at $50 per event and $100 from a total source and pairing that to the White House level, which has existed in both Democratic and Republican administrations. Um, and that level happens to be $20, meaning that um, what Mr. Hines correctly describes as a, even a lavish dinner in Washington could not take place uh, for $20. but that people would be able to, again, receive a plaque after speaking to a group or a T-shirt from the school or a baseball cap or something like that. Do you all have any thoughts on that, on that issue? Well, <clears throat> to return to the theme that I spoke at the beginning, the rules as they now are written would provide, of course, that members could accept gifts of nominal value, T-shirts and baseball caps. There are specific exceptions to the rules that provide for the acceptance of commemorative plaques. And frankly, I don't think anyone's arguing, even in the <coughs> current climate, that any major corruption is developed around the acceptance of a middle school's presentation of T-shirts or a commemorative plaque. There's, there are rules currently uh, that adequately address any of the concerns that people might have about the, the corrupt potential. If we were to go to zero, we would be in a, in, a, in a position where potentially that could be a problem. Yes, and then what's going to happen, which would be therefore viewed as backsliding, is someone will decide that turning down the t-shirts from the middle school is embarrassing to all concerned. So someone's going to then propose an exception and the rules are going to be written back up again. And that's not necessarily healthy either. So it seems to me that the better approach is to retain what we have in the current rules that work and don't seem to have presented any major problem and that address those ordinary everyday situations like the ones you've described. I think Mrs. Slaughter also hit the nail on the head when she talked about the issue of enforcement, which uh, you had in your remarks. Mr. Edwards. I, uh, <clears throat> I see no reason why uh, somebody who is uh, trying to influence your vote should be able to take you to dinner and pay for it. I see no reason why you should receive a gift from anybody trying to influence uh, your vote uh, other than you know the t-shirt or cap variety. Uh, you're all capable, as I was, of buying our own dinners. Uh, I was embarrassed uh, when I was highness the rules have changed somewhat. Uh, I, I received t-shirts and caps and ice buckets with congressional seals on them and briefcases and, you know, from people I didn't know. Uh, there was no excuse for that. And uh, I think one way that is fairly easy, you know, to deal with the public perception is to get rid of uh, the idea of beyond the cap t-shirt trivial amount uh, exception uh, and just eliminate members of Congress uh, being invited out to restaurants where a meal that otherwise might cost somebody $120 that you know, ends up miraculously to be $49.95. Uh, I, I think an almost complete ban on gifts would be a very good idea. Mm -hmm. Frank? We would urge that uh, you draw distinctions between uh, meals and gifts, uh, books, educational materials, and gifts uh, in terms of your definitional uh, efforts here. For example, a um, the Heritage Guide to the Constitution, we just published it, 
108 uh, scholars address each clause of the Constitution, clause by clause, with essays. Then to, if it exceeds some kind of a $20 gift limit, to not let a council on a committee or a member accept that, as, especially as a reference guide for, in, for future hearings, for, for legislative uh, uh, debates, seems a little bit on the silly side to us. And as far as meals go, oftentimes the most convenient time to invite a member and, say, a legislative, some of the legislative staff from that office to discuss health care reform or, or budget issues or national security issues is over a breakfast or a lunch. And to have a small group like that feel uh, compelled to not eat or to, uh, to, to not accept our, just this is a courtesy really to a guest, seems a little bit over the edge as well. So those are to us fundamentally different than nine holes of golf and uh, skybox tickets and that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. Mr. Chairman, um, with respect to uh, caps and, uh, and T-shirts, certainly I th uh, that is a, what we probably would need to do if we were to decide that uh, gifts were inappropriate, period. We would probably need, uh, you would have to find some way to uh, make it uh, acceptable that uh, constituents uh, visiting Washington uh, giving something nominal like a plaque, uh, an award, or something like that, T-shirts or caps would be acceptable. But I do believe that it's, it's best to draw a line on gifts. With respect to, to meals, um, I, I fundamentally believe that transparency is fundamentally the best answer. Um, it's very clear to me that, it, you know, obviously uh, you can have a meal at all kinds of restaurants, and many are very expensive and many are not. Uh, there are many districts in the country or parts of the country where it is extremely expensive to live, and a meal that cost $100 would not seem to be unusual to your constituency. But there are also many more places in the country where that might seem to be uh, inappropriate. And that would really be, again, left to the discretion and the judgment and the wisdom of the member himself or herself. Mm -hmm. And I think that, in effect, that's the best solution. Transparency and the discretion and the wisdom of the members themselves is far better than trying to write rules that uh, are awfully difficult. Uh, the, you write five pages of rules and you have 15 pages of explanation. Okay. Let, let me just jump quickly into the travel issue. And, and uh, I know, Mr. Edwards, you commented on the, uh, on the fact that you didn't accept uh, travel from lobbyists. And frankly, lobbyists are not under the present structure allowed to provide the uh, funding for uh, privately uh, funded travel uh, by members of Congress. But I think that the, uh, the question that, that comes to mind is this issue of disclosure and transparency. I mean, virtually everyone, Mr. Hines, has ended by talking about disclosure, transparency, accountability. Those are the three words that we all use over and over and over again. And I'm wondering if, as you look at the Aspen Institute's effort, if the notion of fully disclosing all of the funding sources for the Aspen Institute would be an option, something that you all would consider supporting. Well, I, you know, I can't speak for the entire institute because the program that I am running uh, is entirely funded by uh, a single foundation that has no interest in legislation, does no, no lobbying. The, uh, but I, you know, I, I know the Aspen Institute would probably have no problem, you know, with giving, for example, Dick Clark's congressional program, which mm -hmm. you all are familiar with, uh, raises all of its money from foundations, you know, that uh, don't lobby and, and that don't have lobbyists on these trips, you know. But in terms of the entire Aspen Institute, I, I have no way of knowing, Dave. Mm -hmm. I know that a number of my colleagues have questions, but I just want to say to you, uh, having come down from Aristotle, Rousseau, and Locke. I uh, was thinking back to my undergraduate days, and I recalled very well that Niccolo Machiavelli never involved himself at all in the local politics. He always stayed above it. And so we appreciate greatly your, uh, once again, coming down to uh, this level with us, uh, Mr. Edwards. So Mr. Diaz-Ballard. <laughs> Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I, I look forward to reading Mr. Bauer and Mr. Daros uh, statements. I wasn't here to hear them, but uh, look forward to reading them. And I did have the pleasure to hear the other distinguished panelists. Uh, Mr. Edwards, who uh, he may not know, but uh, my, it's interesting how staff influences members. He does know that. Uh, and my former legislative director, Elizabeth Humphrey, had worked for him and had uh, extraordinary respect for him. And so I grew to uh, hold uh, Mr. Edwards, even though I didn't have a chance to serve with him, 
uh, in, in uh, great respect, with great respect, based on the stories that uh, my legislative director would, would tell me about what a wonderful member he had been. Well, thank you. If I, if I can just say, uh, uh, one of the members of the committee uh, was on my staff. And uh, as it turned out, I learned from him <laughs> rather than the other way around. <laughs> um, as, as Mr. Hines pointed out, People who have committed crimes uh, recently um, and have been involved in this process uh, one way or another, the legislative process, uh, have been sentenced to under current rules. And it's important for us to keep that in mind. I mean, we, we have made extraordinary progress uh, as a nation and as a Congress in, in achieving transparency. And I think that's a, that's a good point to, to keep in mind. Uh, we, we, we are not. I do not believe we're anywhere near a state of crisis in the sense that um, uh, we, we have made extraordinary progress. And, and I don't think there's any other legislative body in the world that has, quite frankly, the, the transparency that we have. Now, that said, we, we do have a problem in that, as, as the speaker has, has told me when I've discussed this issue, because, by the way, I happen to be, I, I happen to be sin sincerely disturbed about this one issue of of, uh, of travel, uh, paid for uh, privately. As the speaker has said, listen, we know that the overwhelming amount of entities that pay for private travel, I mean, they do it for the right reasons and, and they do it in an honorable way. Uh, but, but there is a, a perception based on recent problems we've had that, that shell uh, not-for-profits uh, really are are, are able to be created uh, for, for, uh, for a purpose that is not appropriate, and in other words, to pay for travel. Now, Mr. Edwards was pointing out that the issue is let's get at or prohibit um, uh, travel paid for privately when they're trying to influence a member's vote. I guess my question is how do you do that? It's not that members, it's not that, that a not-for-profit not will tell the member uh, by the way, this is a trip with regard to an issue that's in the Rules Committee next week uh, in, in, in HR whatever. Uh, information that is dealt with, that is exposed to the member, education, usually has to do with legislation sooner or later. So I think that's what the speaker is pointing at. The issue of number one, how do we get over the shells how do we get over the fact that if you say, well, let's pre-clear, have the staff go in and, and pre-clear uh, uh, and look into these 501c3s to make, make certain they're, they're legitimate, is that really solving the problem? Are we, are we, how do we do it in a way that, it's, that, that is possible uh, to genuinely solve the problem? Uh, and, and then, uh, Mr. Edwards, I don't know how we can know, anyone can know, even the member that an, a, a group seeking to educate you is not seeking to influence a vote sooner or later. So I guess, I don't know if I've made sense, this is my concern. You know, we, we, we don't, Mr. Hines, we don't want to write rules that will require 15 pages of explanation and thus 15 pages of how to get around them. Uh, but, but we do have a problem of perception, a problem of shells having been created, a problem of difficulty in preclearance. In, in, in having a process that is genuinely uh, a preclearance process that will solve the problem, and especially that will solve the problem that Mr. Edwards related to. So, are there any thoughts on the panel with, with regard to? Uh, uh, so you want you, you want to? We'll start from uh, Mr. Bauer. It seems to me, Congressman, you raised a very good point, which is that it is not always very simple to distinguish between the organization that's seeking to provide information and an organization that hopes the information will ultimately dispose the member to vote a certain way on legislation. Uh, Congressman Edwards, for example, mentioned foundations in a field in which I practice campaign finance, for example. There are foundations that spend millions of dollars to, quote, educate, unquote, on the subject of campaign finance because they favor reform and the education is linked to the reforms that they actively promote. So while they are not lobbying organizations, there is no question that they pursue a substantive legislative agenda through tax-exempt educational programs. Uh, so the second point I would make is this. Uh, the question of direct interest 
used to be one of the foundational issues under the House rules. There used to be uh, a gift rule that turned literally on the question of whether an individual did or didn't have a direct interest. And this was a subject of some controversy in the practical application. It was, for example, one of the critical issues that affected former Speaker Wright in the investigation that ultimately led him to resign his position. So it's not a simple question, and the House has had experience with it. The third point I would make is, is, is a broader policy point, which is I think Congressman Edwards sketches out an entirely legitimate and laudable arrangement by which members find uh, an opportunity through privately paid travel expenses to speak with one another, even on subjects like the ones he mentioned, Hobbs and Locke and Rousseau. But I'm concerned, again, about projecting the impression that members having high-minded discussion with one another is necessarily preferable to being exposed to information by people who are genuinely concerned about what the, co what the Congress will do to affect their daily lives. That is not a terribly populist message, not the one I know that the Congressman meant, but it's a message that could be derived from seeking to limit members to just those settings rather than settings where they meet average Americans who are in genuinely concerned about what Congressman, Congress might do to affect the wages that are paid to them or the living conditions they and them, their families find themselves in. Yes, Mr. Darrow. Thank you, Congressman. You raised some excellent points. Uh, we believe at the United Jewish Communities that the answer is pre-approval, full disclosure, and post-review. You've brought up these uh, shells, uh, these uh, 501c3 entities that served as conduits uh, for lobbyists to uh, fund these junkets. I think it's worth noting that these entities were, did not have lobbyists on their payroll. They were not advocating for specific legislation. So proposals that say, okay, separate lobbyists from travel would not have, uh, would not have prevented these, uh, the, these uh, junkets that occurred uh, over the last few years. Now, I am a registered lobbyist. Uh, I believe that if we were to have a hypothetical trip to go down to the Gulf region to look at the, uh, the impact of Katrina and Rita and the governmental response or lack of response there too, it would be valuable for members of, of uh, Congress and their staff to have me with them to explain what it is that the United Jewish Communities is doing, how we're spending the $28 million that we've raised there, how we're lobbying you and your staff on various uh, pieces of legislation that are there. Similarly, if you were to go to, the, uh, to Chicago to look at our uh, social service agencies in Chicago that the Jewish Federation of Chicago runs, to have the Chicago's Federation's lobbyists go with you to build that relationship to explain how this section of, uh, of, of Title III works uh, to fund this and how this is a private public partnership and how there's state money here and federal money uh, and to build that relationship so that when we're here working through legislation, uh, again, that relationship is built and you're there with experts rather than uh, just going there with folks who don't maybe understand all of the components uh, that happen here in, uh, in, uh, in Washington. Uh, I think that by, by simplifying it down to separate lobbyists from travel uh, is, uh, is counterproductive. And I think that, uh, again, these, these C3 organizations that were used as conduits did not have lobbyists. That does not solve the problem. Mr. Well, Congressman, I, you make a very good point. I think that, uh, uh, first of all, in, in response to what Dave said, uh, as I said in my, in my remarks, I think politics is the most noble profession, you know, and it's much more noble than just studying Aristotle and Locke. And I have no problem with, with people gathering together to talk about the issues that matter. So part of the, the solution is the pre-approval process. I don't favor having lobbyists be part of the, uh, of the trip, but, you know, when you, when you have a pre-approval process, that includes looking at the agenda. It's not only how many hours you spend uh, during the day in serious work. Uh, it's what kind of other activities they are. You know, whether you spend two hours, you know, talking seriously with each other and then you go play golf for four hours. Uh, what you study, how balanced it is, if, if it is. I mean, there are all kinds of elements that you can put into the pre-approval process so that you can determine whether or not what's taking place uh, is a serious thing as opposed to a shell. <coughs> Congressman, <coughs> excuse me, I would also raise the point that as 501c3s are already barred from, <clears throat> excuse me, barred from um, advocating on behalf of particular legislation. So yeah. that's a check right there. Yeah. <clears throat> when we develop programs, uh, we always try to make them relevant to debates that are going on up here. So 
uh, whether it's entitlement reform or national security issues, there's going to be an overlap between the issues we would want members to delve into and legislative debates that are either in process or forthcoming. So we shy away from that kind of distinction. Uh, Congressman, um, when there is a when there is a pre-approval process, let's say by the committee of jurisdiction over uh, uh, the subject matter, which would be the purpose of the trip, it seems to me that's a very good check. Secondly, if the members and the com and the of the committee that are traveling have to, in effect. Uh, make a public report, the committee puts it on their website, they know who traveled and, and how much was spent and what they yes. did. Those things, again, we get right down, I think, to, the, to the, the fact that members, if they know that it's going to be a public record, then they know that they want to make sure that they uh, take care to see, and the committee would take care, the committee authorizing the trip would make care, take care to see that it's a legitimate business trip. I think, again, sunshine and, and, and judgment of the members is the most important thing we can possibly do. Well, I've heard a number of uh, new uh, ideas from you, and I appreciate it very much, all of you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Mrs. Slaughter. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, and, you know, sometimes I think we're in danger here of really missing the kernel that we're all looking for. Um, I, I don't agree that we're in good times here. I think this is really very serious business here in this Congress. And um, talking about writing new rules and reinforcing those rules, I'm not sure, given the fact that we didn't enforce the rules we had, as Mr. Hines pointed out, is somewhat troubling. Um, it makes me think every time this institution shakes itself from top to bottom, we sort of go through this routine of, oh, look at us now. Uh, and it reminds me of something Confucius said that I always liked, that a, a great noise is heard on the stair, but no one comes into the room. <laughs> and that's exactly what I'm afraid almost that we may do here. For example, I know that Duke Cunningham knew that it was not good for him to solicit bribes written down on a piece of paper with the seal of the House of Representatives on it. I know that. So. Uh, there's a saying, you know, that we hope that everybody would know what the rule is, would not have been good in that case. At the same time, I keep saying to myself, if he was able to sell contracts at the Pentagon, someone at the Pentagon helped him. So are we really going far enough with what we're talking about here? We've had no oversight in five, six years now over anything these committee, these agencies are doing, none. And uh, so that, that part troubles me a great deal. Um, and Mr. Hines, I, let me tell you what I think is wrong with the meal. Uh, I think I, I don't mind a T-shirt, a hat, something a child gives me, a plaque for being a good mother. Now, that's fine with me. But when you sit down with a meal at, with a lobbyist, you are giving him or her an hour and a half for more of your time. And the other person, the other half of that equation is not there. Now, I know that when people took members out and they passed that bankruptcy bill, that there was nobody sitting at any of those tables who had, as I understand it, the vast majority of people who declare bankruptcy do it because there's a, a divorce, loss of job, serious illness. There was nobody representing the point of view of those people uh, to counteract what the credit card companies wanted. And the same thing that, that we see over and over again. So I, I, that's what I see is wrong with that. Um, we do hear from the other side. I mean, I, I go home every week. I hear it in the grocery store. I'm in the phone book, always have been. So I, I'm, I'm accessible. I want to know what the other side is thinking. But I'm afraid that too many of my colleagues only have dinner and time with people who present that one single point of view and don't think about what is really uh, what's going to happen. We, I think the Medicare bill is a great example of that. Uh, we're seeing chaos all over the country with the thing. Uh, and uh, uh, the way it was written and the way it was passed, I think, indicates that the lobbyists had free sway on it. So we know and that what I guess we'd like to think is everybody who gets elected to the House of Representatives would be a fully formed, ethical, moral human being. But we've got the rules already. I think what we've done is gone too far with legislation, and we have absolutely no enforcement. It was surprising to me that here, to hear that as few as 5% of the lobbyists in this city even report at all. There is no mechanism by which we check to see whether they have reported, what they have reported, 
And if they have not reported, do what do we do about it? This seems to me, if we're going to do anything at all, that is the major thing we have to do. I'd also like to hear your view on whether or not we should remove the Ethics Committee from the House itself and have an outside Ethics Committee, as we've been talking about for years, perhaps a panel of retired members, panel of retired judges, or somebody else to, to, get, that, to get that part done. But to sit and, and continually talk about, you know, we have these rules and let's strengthen these rules and, and we can go on this trip but not that trip, to tell you the truth, they get around every one of them. I think to take a trip to England and to Scotland to chat with the Queen and play at St. Andrews, that trip was represented as one that was done by a nonprofit agency. And it took three or four years for that to come to the front. So that's not the answer. And I think we're going to have to delve a little deeper here on banning this and banning that and what we're going to do and try to really get down to the fact where we can, if we can't expect everybody to come here to uphold the ethics that we would hope they've lived by all their lives, um, that we have got to find some way of enforcement and a way to penalize it and a way to deal with it and to get it over with because uh, to leave it out there festering, I think, has, uh, has caused us a great deal of trouble. And I fear will for some time to come because I'm not sure we're getting at the answer. I would, uh, I don't see lobbyists need to go on, on trips with us. Uh, we're perfectly capable if we go with somebody from uh, CRS or somebody else to talk to us, but we don't need lobbies so long. But I'm really, I think the crux of it for me is if you're only going to hear one side of an issue, you're only doing one side of your job. And that's what we're, frankly, we're all skirting around here. It's what any, these people can do to get to us, to give us things, to buy our favor, buy our time, without any consideration of what about the other half of that equation, and that's the people who disagree with the lobbyists that we meet with. Does that make any sense to you? That's Mr. Right. Frank? Um, I, based on my experience with uh, the Ethics Committee and getting TRIP's uh, agenda mm -hmm. uh, reviewed and then approved, it, it's been my experience that if the St. Andrews golf outing had been fully disclosed in advance, the Ethics Committee would have, uh, staff at least, would have looked at it and said, you can't do that. You can't but they have... didn't fully disclose it. Well, so I mean, they I, said I, it was going to be paid for by a uh, charity. Right. right? And, and so the agenda that was put in front of, uh, of the system was different than what actually transpired. And so what happened there was that all you do is you go to the Ethics Committee and you say this wonderful group here to prevent mm -hmm. calluses is taking <laughs> me somewhere. Right. Uh, there is no way for anybody to check that. Well, that's why I, in my testimony, what I recommend is pre and post. So in other words, you have to have, after the trip, some kind of confirmation saying that this wonderful agenda that was submitted beforehand was actually what happened, and that they didn't suddenly cancel the four-hour seminar on Medicare Part D and replace it with nine holes of golf. So that, that is, a, is an accountability uh, mechanism in place there. But you do understand <clears throat> that, that we've got mechanisms in place that, that cover, that ice the cake, mm -hmm. but that really have no force of law, no anything, nobody to look, nobody to check. It's a, it's a brilliant honor system, a buddy system. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm going over there to St. Andrews and I'm mm -hmm. going to learn wonderful things to come back and tell you about hydraulics. Uh, this is, nobody questions that. And then we find ourselves in the positions that we're in now, uh, and all of us, you know, trying to find some kind of piece of legislation or something that we can form to stop that. Uh, but if we don't, um, I'm, I'm just mm -hmm. not sure we're getting at the crux of it, I guess is what I want to say. I think, I think we're, still, we're still doing what we've always done before, and that's try to find a new way to do this and tweak it a little bit and make it a little different, then we'll all be okay. I don't feel that. Yes, sir. Um, I would, thank you. I would, I would just say, ma'am, that we, uh, as I said, uh, I am a lobbyist. Uh, I'm not a lobbyist for a, uh, an electric company or a, a major uh, hospital uh, for-profit entity, uh, but I am a lobbyist and I'm engaged in Medicaid, I'm engaged in Medicare. Uh, we are engaged in these, these policy discussions as nonprofits. Again, the trip that you were talking about, the, the entity, the 501c3 that brought, uh, that did that trip, uh, was the conduit for that trip, did not have any lobbyists. So just saying that uh, limiting lobbyists isn't the answer. We that, bring... You sponsored the trip we're talking about to St. Andrews? Yes, ma'am. Uh, 
Well, the fact that they didn't have lobbyists was not the case. The fact was that they were but, covering for the people who really paid for the trip. But the, not, the nonprofit entity that was the conduit did not have, did not, does not advocate for legislation, had no federally registered lobbyists. But they didn't pay for it either. This, which is, which I think is part of the point, which is that it's enforcement. That the current right. rules are there. It's enforcement, and so, uh, as again, as often happens in Washington, there is a problem. What needs to be done here is to enforce the current rules to beef up the process, the structure uh, that you have in place here in Congress, so that uh, the current rules that are there, uh, and maybe beef up those well, rules. But to say that uh, all of us who are nonprofits, I represent. Uh, tens of thousands of social service agencies across right. this country. And under some of the bills that are out there, uh, because I am a federal registered lobbyist and because the United Jewish Communities has lobbyists and the Chicago Federation has lobbyists, our entire system, uh, the Federation uh, in New York, the Federation well, in South let Florida me, would let, be banned. Let me claim my time a moment. I'm not talking about who has a lobbyist and who doesn't. I'm talking about using a nonprofit as a cover for something that has nothing to do with the actual fact. And we, would and we have no mechanism here to do anything about that. And, and I would uh, respectfully submit that that's a, a process question, and that's something that, that this body can do to beef up your process by which you enforce the rules that are in place. That rather than ban all trips or ban most trips or, or set these high, high standards that we believe are too high, that you beef up the entities through which you, uh, you enforce them, that you have more uh, pre-approval. You look through the trips. Is, it, is this just a golf and gambling trip? Uh, or is it like our many trips to Israel, where it's 15 hours and meetings with 15 ministers and uh, looking at strategic uh, helicoptering around the country, looking at strategic places that you can't really get uh, in, a, in a unidimensional policy brief? Uh, and then and make uh, have full disclosure by the member, full disclosure by the relevant uh, entity here in Congress, and then post-review. Uh, and as my colleagues have said, uh, if it turns out that instead of meeting with uh, 15 ministers of, uh, of the Israeli government, uh, you played 15 holes of golf on Israel's only golf course, uh, then you, uh, you uh, have appropriate action to enforce uh, that misrepresentation. Well, Mr. Frank, even the Heritage Foundation had a problem, I think, with Belhaven and, uh, and Malaysia. So uh, that, you know, to show uh, the, the, what I think I'm, I, I'm concerned about here is that uh, we sit here and we discuss all these things. Whatever the legislation will be, we don't yet know. But we probably will not come any closer to solving the problem here. Mickey? Well, I, I just want to comment on one of the head. things. You know, I, I do think that pre-approval and post-review are both are very good ideas. I don't favor the idea of an independent commission. Uh, you know, 99.99 percent of the members of Congress are, are honest, ethical, moral, uh, very intelligent. Uh, you know, th this is a body that can police itself. It needs to do it. it need, needs to have the oversight. It needs to, to have clear standards. It needs to have, uh, you know, an ethics committee that is functioning uh, actively. But we don't. Uh, but, but I don't think that uh, uh, this body you know, needs to turn to any other outside group to do its work for it. It's quite capable uh, of doing it itself, I think. There's no, uh, that, that's a great statement. Once again, we hear a lot of great statements, but there's, uh, there isn't enough evidence there to convict that in court, I'm afraid. We, the Ethics Committee here has not functioned yet, so. Um, and I, I think something Maybe has got to change. be done. Well, <laughs> that may have been one of the reasons why, why people felt I can just do what I please here. Um, and there seems to have been a lot of that going on. Okay. Thank you very much, Mrs. Slaughter. Let me say that uh, we are uh, voting on the previous question on a rule that uh, was reported out of this committee yesterday on the floor, and it appears that uh, we have uh, an agreement to proceed with consideration of the rule under a voice vote. So we have only one vote. And so what we want to do is, is we want to continue with our work here. Did you vote, Mr. Hastings? I did, Mr. Chairman. I you did. Approved. Oh, you made it. Well, wonderful. Well, congratulations. <coughs> and I guess uh, we'll have the PQ vote right now, and uh, so you've done that. And what I'm going to do is, is I'm going to call on you now, and then uh, Mr. diaz Bellart will come back, and let's hope that I don't get to miss the vote on the previous question here. So please proceed, Mr. Hastings. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, in light of the fact that I didn't hear our distinguished witnesses, um, I, I don't have specific questions of, of for them. I do have, as all of us, uh, continuing concerns uh, regarding um, our reform of this process uh, with specific in, in, emphasis from me 
on the ethics process as opposed uh, uh, to the lobbying. For example, Mr. Chairman, as you recall, I was one of 50 members uh, uh, that did not vote in favor of uh, banning uh, former congresspersons from coming on the floor of the House or using uh, the House uh, gymnasium. I do believe, uh, uh, Mr. Chairman, that in light of my experiences, having benefited uh, uh, from uh, uh, travel at the instance of groups that may be identified as lobbyists, that there was pre-travel disclosure and subsequent disclosure after the travel. And I benefited immensely um, uh, beyond ordinary comprehension um, uh, from those trips. I can use APAC as a for example. Unfortunately for me, time conflicts have always caused me not to be able to go to an Aspen Institute. But I know of no member on either side of the aisle that has gone uh, uh, to an Aspen Institute program that did not come back with substantive information that was critical to policy making in the House of Representatives. Or toward that end, I could argue um, in the run-up to the Singapore Trade Agreement. Um, I had the uh, uh, good fortune uh, to uh, visit Singapore and to begin to understand that dynamic uh, better and came back and <coughs> talked with the then trade representative about an issue that uh, no one had uh, 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 talked about, and that was the defense side of the story of that particular trade agreement. I could say the same thing with visits to Taiwan and China. I don't know how in a globalizing world we can isolate ourselves um, uh, uh, from the opportunity to utilize the experiences of those um, uh, groups uh, uh, that sponsor uh, these trips. And I might add, um, uh, for anybody that goes on uh, one of the APAC trips, all I can say is hold your breath because you don't get a chance to do anything other than go to meetings. Um, <laughs> and I might add, in defense of those who uh, uh, travel uh, extraordinary uh, distances uh, to try and gain insight and information uh, uh, for development of policy, um, uh, that I don't see anything wrong with or um, a person playing tennis or playing golf or going swimming. Uh, I've not had um, uh, the benefit of uh, doing either. But in cultural events, I notice some of the legislation is going to try to ban people from seeing cultural events. That's half of our problem in this world, is not understanding other folks' cultures. Um, and if the American taxpayer is saying, fine, you can't go on an NAACP-sponsored trip or an APAC or um, other kind of trip. If that's what they're saying, and they're going to be willing to pay for those of us that need to travel in order to gain additional information to develop policy, uh, then I can say they're getting ready to have a, a tremendous outlay of expenses. I personally think um, uh, that whatever people perceive as a scandal didn't come about because of uh, lobbyists um, uh, here in Washington who operate ethically within the prescribed uh, uh, standards of uh, uh, this um, uh, uh, Congress and those congresspersons who operate in an ethical manner and have uh, uh, nothing uh, to hide uh, uh, regarding their travel. Uh, early on, I found that editors of newspapers especially are fond of talking about travel for junkets. I've been in Congress now 13 years, and on two occasions, I was the most traveled member of the House of Representatives, House of Representatives. and I was seriously disturbed when I lost my title to someone else, uh, because I do believe now that members in this body, as well as people from around this country, I presently serve uh, as a result of some of those experiences as the president of the Parliamentary Assembly of the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe, wherein I had an opportunity working with my uh, colleagues to have the seminal um, uh, uh, definitions of anti-Semitism come forward in conferences that I was one of six original sponsors of as a result of many of, of, of the undertakings uh, that I have uh, 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 gone forward on. I don't intend to stop trying to learn 
what this world is about in an effort to put it in a context that's meaningful for those of us in America. I apologize, Mr. Chairman, for taking so much time and certainly to our outstanding witnesses. I doubt very seriously, or uh, having reviewed briefly the testimony of those that submitted it, that any of you have said anything that I disagree with. But I sure hope that this institution doesn't busy itself, eating itself alive uh, because of um, uh, some uh, uh, body uh, that did something wrong and not uh, condoning anybody in that capacity. But I can assure you this, and this is 43 years of lawyering talking to you. You show me a lobbying reform or a reform, and I will show you a loophole. Thank you. Mr. Hastings. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. At the outset, let me uh, uh, thank Chairman Dreyer for his invitation to the Ethics Committee to participate in this. Uh, unfortunately, the, the ranking member uh, declined, but as a member of the Rules Committee, I fully intend to get uh, involved in, in this process. Uh, let me associate myself with my friend and namesake from Florida. I've been on several trips with him, and he, uh, in his uh, normal way, says it uh, very well. But we are in a situation now where we have to find a remedy uh, to perceptions out there that are uh, largely thought by the American people that there's a lot of abuses going on. And, and what our challenge is is try to find the best remedy, and that's the difficult part of any of the political process. I, um, I, I've heard, as we have all have heard, that transparency uh, is the key to however we make this work. Uh, I, uh, I agree to that. I think the trick then is how do you define transparency in a way that uh, doesn't make winners and losers. And by that I mean we have a tendency uh, in this, in any legislative body, when we draft legislation to uh, go after particular areas and, and, and invariably, no matter what the piece of legislation is, there's a carve out uh, for somebody or somebody else that is more equal than others. That's just the nature, I think, of our process. So what is the best way to do, to do this? And I was intrigued by Mr. Hines when he was talking about the gift rule. Uh, he suggested in the gift rule, uh, as it relates to meals, that the best way to do this is to, uh, on a monthly basis, I think you said, I, that could probably be debated, but on a regular basis, uh, list the times that you go out to dinner. And the self-correcting, I don't know if that was the word you used, but the self-correcting mechanism uh, of the member would be the cost of the meal. In other words, if you come from an area, I come from a rural area, there's not very many meals that you would go out where, you know, the tab is $100. Uh, so uh, I, if you posted that on a regular basis, uh, I would expect that there's somebody that, uh, in my case, if I avail myself of that and I, I don't go out to dinner very much in this town at all, and all of a sudden they saw a whole bunch of uh, $100 meals, $150 meals, I would probably hear from that. That's a self-correcting self mechanism. And it's really a pretty simple way to do. Now, what has to happen, of course, is the member has to report, as do uh, the lobbyist or the recipient of, or the person, the, the host, I should say, of whatever event is. I, I think that principle can be transferred, therefore, to the, uh, the travel exactly the same way. We talked about travel, talked about preclearance. Again, the question is, is what is the, the best way? Uh, Mr. Bauer, I think you, you said one of the things that we ought to guard against is not to be too narrow in who we allow to have trips taken. Uh, I, would, I won't put words into your mouth, but it's, it, it, by our trying to make legislation to find that, we're making winners and losers in the process. And I think you're suggesting that we, should, we ought not do that. So if we were to transfer the same principle that Mr. Hines talked about as far as meals, to travel where? picking up on what Mr. Darrell mentioned as, as laying out in a time frame before the, before the trip, uh, where you're going, who you're going to see, and then after the trip have a post-trip uh, post uh, adjustment. It seemed to me that over time that would be a self-connecting mechanism because the same people that are looking at the, the meals would look at this and uh, they may see through the, uh, the individual that, uh, or the, the organization that, uh, that uh, uh, might have, uh, you know, abused the system in some way. And so uh, if, we are, if we are moving in that direction, I'd like to have, have any of you respond to at least the concept that I'm talking about where 
where rather than, than make winners or losers, we are completely transparent ahead of time and after the time. Do you think something like that would work? I'd open it up to anybody, you, Mr. Heinz. Uh, Congressman, I think that's exactly the kind of a system that works best because the members, in effect, control their own destiny in the sense that they know what is appropriate to uh, uh, be re when it's reported, how will their constituents respond to it? How will the newspapers in their district respond to it? How will their opponents respond to it? That's the best correction I can possibly think of. And I, and I really, I mean, I, I feel like everyone else does here. I think travel is really very important. Uh, my partner, Al Swift, who I believe you know, yes. uh, feels very, very strongly uh, that his service as a congressman was very, very much aided by the fact that he had opportunities to travel, not only for the information that you learn, but it's a, he said it was the best way he ever had to get to know members on the other side of the aisle in a way that was not confrontational, working over amendments and everything else and fighting in committees, but that he had an opportunity to get to know people as, pe as individuals with their lives and their family problems and everything else. And once you get to know people as individuals, when they offer an amendment, you don't automatically think what nefarious scheme is going on. You think, let's try to find a solution. He said that was one of the most important things he ever got out of travel. So I, I mean, I feel it's very important that it be permitted. But again, with a transparency system and pre-clearance and post-watching, I think it works. I, I would agree, Mr. Hastings. I think that your, your framework is exactly the answer. Uh, the bill that is being uh, discussed or debated on the floor of the Senate today uh, has that sort of process, has a full disclosure uh, within seven days of the trip taking place. Uh, we would leave it up to, to, to you and your colleagues as to figure out exactly what the best mechanism is for disclosure. I know that there's at least one senator who has on his website a uh, spreadsheet that lists every trip he has been on, CODEL and uh, privately funded trip, uh, with the, uh, the dates, the place they went, how much money was spent, who sponsored it, and what it was all about. Uh, that sort of sunshine uh, and transparency is exactly the sort of enforcement mechanism in tandem with uh, the appropriate bodies within uh, your house and the other house uh, enforcing uh, the rules and regulations to make sure that they fall, fall within uh, the criteria for, for what a bona fide trip is, that they're related to the official duties, that they have minimal or incidental recreational or, or entertainment component uh, and they're not designed to influence a specific piece of legislation. Uh, I think that uh, sunshine again, transparency is the answer and uh, full disclosure uh, on, on the member's website, on the committee's website, on uh, anyone's website and uh, I'm sure that our friends in the news media uh, will, uh, will highlight any trips that uh, are not appropriate. Uh, Mr. Bauer, would you, would you comment on the, the remark you made just briefly about uh, too narrow? I, I appreciate your hearing that. Uh, yes, my, my remark, Congressman, went to the point that we ought not to decide in advance what sort of organizations have a worthy reason to have the company of members of Congress or to communicate with them. Uh, I question whether or not we can plumb motives adequately to say that certain organizations have a direct vote influencing function and others less so, first of all, the rules as they're currently written would require members to consider very carefully accepting a gift, even if it otherwise fell within the exception, if the gift was offered to them, say, by an organization with a direct interest in a markup to follow 48 hours later. The rules make it very clear. Members have to exercise discretion even in accepting gifts that would otherwise be permissible. Secondly. I don't think we should assume that all organizations that are engaged in educational activity have no interest in legislation. Many do. And thirdly, I think even ones that are more avowedly concerned with what Congress does are precisely the organizations that have reasons to want to have contact with members of Congress, to provide information to them, to have more extended forms of communication with them. So in that sense, I'm agreeing with your point that we ought not to structure the rules uh, to have some lose and some win. Yeah. Mr. Frank? Yeah. Um, Agree with your the general thrust of your construct there, Congressman. Very well well stated too. Uh, one caveat would be I think the burden of reporting on, uh, should be on the member and on the staff in the sense that you don't want to make yourselves vulnerable to someone who uh, may wrongly say, "Well, I took so and so out to dinner or to, on some kind of a golf trip," when in fact it didn't happen. There has to be some thought given to how you cur uh, protect yourselves against that uh, situation, which, given the uh, 
in human nature is could actually happen. So. Yeah, I, Mr. Edwards. Yeah, I, I just wanted to. I, the transparency is obviously extremely important, uh, and in terms of a member's relationship with his or her constituents, uh, you know, there there is a self-correcting mechanism, and and, and uh, it's helpful. Uh, but the other issue that you have to consider is the overall public impression of the behavior of the Congress as a whole, where you might have an individual member who is able to defend back home for whatever reason, either a, a safe seat or uh, uh, whatever, be able to defend uh, what he or she has done. But you also have to make sure that the, the public generally has a a good feeling about the ethics uh, of the Congress. I'm not sure transparency alone uh, is the answer to that, and I thought that uh, uh, Congresswoman Slaughter made an interesting point, as others have too, and, and that is often when you have these trips uh, that have a public purpose uh, in which uh, there is a, a case made for or against a particular kind of legislation, it's not always true that both sides of the debate uh, are heard or able to do the same thing. And so there needs to also be uh, a way to level the playing field a little bit so it's not one side or the other that, that has the only voice uh, in getting people off for you know a weekend somewhere. Uh, last week we had a panel and, and our discussion was on lobbyists. I won't dwell on that, but I, I viewed and still view lobbyists as, as individuals being part of an uh, honorable profession. I mean, after all, that activity is protected by the First Amendment. And uh, before I came into uh, uh, office, I was in business, the distribution business, and my responsibility, uh, uh, obviously to my enterprise, uh, was to decide which products to sell. And I had people come in on both sides, and I'd have to ultimately make a determination. Well, I, I think that uh, everybody in, in this, uh, uh, this body in any legislature, for that matter, Congress or state legislature, uh, if, if the issue is is uh, is uh, enough for us to act on, there, there's going to be two sides that's going to come in. We have to make that determination, what, whatever it is, and, and, that, and the lobbyists are the conduit uh, to that. I think that's an honorable uh, uh, profession. Well, I uh, I appreciate uh, your thoughts, uh, and and going back, I've been on uh, several uh, codels with my friend from uh, Florida, and, and I know that. Uh, uh, I know that he has learned a great deal. I've learned a great deal on the trips uh, that I've made. I know Mr. McGovern has a great deal of interest in Central America before he was even elected. He should not be denied the opportunity, in my view, to go down there and pursue the, whatever those activities are. But the key is, is how we're going to define that. And I'm just afraid that if we get too complicated at the end of the day, uh, as uh, again, as my friend from Florida said, you're going to find a loophole. So we've got to find a way where we don't do that. That is, that is somewhat self uh, uh, self correcting, and that's that's the trick that we have to go through. So thank you very much for your testimony. Appreciate it. Were you recognized by Mr. Trier, or Were you out of the room, Mr. McGovern? Okay. Well, you're recognized now. Thank you. Sure. Um, let me just, uh, for the record, uh, insert uh, the letter from uh, the ranking Democrat on the Ethics Committee, Alan Mollahan, uh, as to why. Was it already put in? I mean, I, I think it, it might be important just to uh, just to highlight a couple of things here that uh, uh, his concern was that in the near future the Standards Committee will be discussing and acting on a number of enforcement matters that involve the interpretation and apl application of the gift and travel rules, and the committee's enforcement responsibilities are extremely sensitive and are at least in part judicial in nature. In these circumstances, I do not believe it would be appropriate for committee members to participate in the hearings that we are convening. And he goes on and expresses other. Uh, concerns, but I just think, for the record, it's, it's. I mean, there is that that he has a legitimate concern as to why he didn't want to have a have a joint hearing here. First of all, let me thank you all for for being here, and uh, and I uh, and, and Mr. Edwards, thank you for uh, uh, not only for your testimony, but also uh, I, I, I read your columns in the Massachusetts newspapers, and I've seen you on uh, various talk shows, and uh, and I always appreciate your perspective. And um, and Mr. Frank, let me tell, let me say something that may shock some people here, but I actually endorse the Heritage uh, Foundation's orientation program. I went on it. I remember that. Um, and um, as you can tell from my voting record, I didn't <laughs> follow very much of what was said. We can take you on the next one. <laughs> yeah. But, um, but I thought it was very helpful because I learned a lot. And um, I, I also uh, got to know some of my colleagues who probably otherwise I wouldn't have had an opportunity to kind of sit down and get to know on a on a more one-on-one -on -one basis. And I think there's value in that. One of the problems, I think, in this 
uh, uh, Congress is the lack of collegiality. Uh, and I think the way you overcome that is you try to get people in settings where they're not always screaming at each other about issues. Uh, and there's great value to that. Um, and as a result, that you learn to talk to each other. And sometimes you even find common ground. So, um, you know, I appreciate that. Look, at the, here's the problem, uh, I think, that we're all faced with. And that is that, um, you know, all of us want more accountability and more transparency. I think that's certainly part of the answer here. But I think we're here uh, not by accident. We're here because things are getting out of control. Uh, and there's a perception all across this country that this place is corrupt. I mean, that's the, that's the perception out there. They're reading about the Duke Cunningham scandals. They're reading about Jack Abramoff. They're, you know, reading about potential indictments and all that kind of stuff. So in that climate, here we come to show that we are responsive to what the American people are concerned about. And so what we do here, um, I think, not only has to satisfy us that, in fact, we're putting in the right oversight and, and doing the right checks and balance, but I think we have to do something that will actually make the American people feel that, in fact, we've fixed the problem. Uh, that, in fact, we're getting at these uh, scandals, that we're, 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 we're truly banning um, trips that, quite frankly, should not be paid for. And, um, and so it, it makes me wonder, uh, it makes me, you know, again, I, I'm, I'm somebody who, has, who, puts a, who thinks there's value in these trips. Uh, let me tell you, if you travel with the uh, State Department to a country where you may disagree with the administration's policy, um, it's very hard to be able to make appointments with people who they don't want you to see. Um, and usually they have someone following you all the time. And sometimes in countries uh, which they consider dangerous, they don't let you go to certain areas. I mean, they, they ban you from going out to certain areas. So uh, where, whereas if you're on a, a privately funded trip, you can go wherever you want to go. You can talk to whoever you want to talk to. And I think it's important to hear both sides, as, as uh, Mr. Slaughter pointed out. But what, what has happened here um, obviously is that um, there isn't a kind of a, a, a filter and there isn't proper oversight on these trips. I mean, we're reading about all these golf trips and other trips that, well, you know, I, I th they don't pass the smell test. Um, and what's troublesome is the problem with all of that is really not the organization that sponsored the trip. It's not the lobbyists. You know, it's the member of Congress. I mean, I think everybody here knows, you know, what's legitimate and what's not legitimate. Um, and I think every, you know, and I think the fact that people choose to do trips that really don't pass the smell test, um, they do it because they can. And they know there's no accountability. And yeah, you have to, you have to file with the, uh, you know, file all your trips, they're all made public. And then you come up with some explanation that, you know, I had a, I, I learned, I had a conference with some diplomat or somebody on a particular issue. and. And I learned something, and so therefore it was a value. And um, uh, but it seems to me that what's uh, what's missing here, and I think Mr. Slaughter touched on it, is um, is proper oversight, you know, and kind of a, a filter to be able to say, you know, this is legitimate, this isn't. Um, and I think there's a perception throughout the country that, you know, uh, if we put together, you know, a separate committee to go through this, that it, you know. It won't work, you know. That uh, you know, members will be nice to other members, and you want to go here, fine. Um, which argues for whether or not there should be some sort of a separate, independent kind of committee uh, that looks at this stuff. Now, I'm not saying that, you know, we can't come up with a with an independent with, with a committee here in, in Congress that will will do its job. But the fact of the matter is, I don't think people have much trust in what's going on here. I mean, we've had leaders of this House abuse the system. Um, and there is a feeling that anything goes. And so I guess I'll go back to what Mr. Slutter said. I mean, you know, we're all talking about enforcement and all, we're all talking about how you, you know, make sure that all the travel that, uh, that we do here is actually based on something legitimate. I mean, do you think that kind of an independent or, you know, a, a, or, or a panel that's outside of uh, elected officials, you know, would be a more appropriate way to, um, I mean, not only to clear these trips, but also to, I mean, I'm worried about people's perceptions about what goes on here. I think this is an honor, I think politics is an honorable profession. I think most of the people who are up here are good people. Um, but there is a feeling out across this country that that's not the case. And so part of what we're trying to do here is re restore some integrity uh, to this body to make sure that people 
all across this country actually believe that we are we get it and we're doing the right thing and that there's proper oversight and I just be curious about whether you have any opinions on kind of an, an outside panel that would review these trips well congressman as, as I said a little earlier I I have confidence in the members of Congress to be able to establish the rules and to enforce them uh, you're not going to find a group of outsiders who come together, no matter what their qualifications, no matter uh, uh, what their credentials, uh, who are going to be able to bring a higher level of integrity uh, or concern about the reputation of the Congress to the to that task. So, you know, I, I don't favor an outside group. I think th this is a matter of the Congress yes. policing itself, well, and I think it's quite capable of doing well, so. Well, I guess my response to that would be, and I think somebody who's watching this would say, we haven't done it. I mean, we're reading about abuses every day in the newspaper, <clears throat> You haven't done your job with oversight. What, what, what makes anybody believe that things will change? I mean, ultimately, this controversy will die down, you know, and we're going to have the rules on the books. They're clearly not being enforced. Uh, people in leadership positions here are abusing the, uh, you know, their, their privileges. So, I mean, I agree with you. I mean, you can, I think there are good people that could do it, but the fact of the matter is we haven't done it. So, you know, where's the, what, what gives people the confidence that well, things will change? One, one of the uh, speakers before made the comment about uh, not overreacting. There are, uh, not counting resident commissioners, there are 435 House members uh, and what, 432 or whatever uh, are not accused of any wrongdoing whatsoever. Yeah. Uh, and I, I think you need to keep that in perspective. I mean, you know, uh, in any group, you get a group of, of business leaders or a group of uh, uh, executive branch officials or whatever else, you're going to find somebody uh, who has acted inappropriately and gotten away with it for a while. Uh, but the fact is that this is an institution in which almost all of the members uh, act honorably, act within the rules. And, and I think you want to be careful not to be fueling a misperception by the public. Well, you well know, I'm, I'm not sure the public here. is totally off on this. And I'm going, to, I'm going to be very blunt about this. I mean, we have rules that govern the way legislation needs to be brought to the floor. We have rules that are constantly waived. And part of, the, you know, the concern, and, and, a lot, and lots of the concern and lots of the controversy have been that, you know, you, Mr. Slotter mentioned the prescription drug bill. You know, that came up here in the middle of the night. No one read it, you know, and uh, all the rules were waived. So you didn't have a layover, so people didn't have to read it. It goes to the floor. You know, we have legislation that gets, that doesn't even get designed by the Committee of Jurisdiction. It comes up here, goes to the floor, and again, you know, you read the articles in the newspaper afterwards, and it looks like, you know, the appearance is certainly that some particular special interest, you know, wanted this, and that's what you got. So, you know, we, we have rules for everything, and I'm telling you, they get broken all the time. And, um, and I, you know, and I, I, I do believe there are good people to enforce these rules, but I, I think that uh, for whatever reason, um, there is kind of a culture in this particular Congress where the rules don't matter, um, whether it's legislation or whether it's, uh, whether it's enforcing, you know, uh, good ethics when it comes to trips and, and other stuff. So I, uh, yeah, I, I want rules enforced and I, I wish there was a better way to, uh, you know, to make sure that those who are responsible with enforcing the rules actually enforce them. We scream all the time about waiving rules and breaking rules. Um, and, uh, but, you know, if you watch C-SPAN, you can hear it. But um, I, I think for a lot of people, um, you know, it, 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 for whatever reason, it, it, hasn't, it hasn't amounted into this big, uh, you know, response to, to hold Congress more accountable. No, it's hard to get those changes made. We tried it for uh, all the 16 years that I was in the House. And, uh, yeah, things have gotten without worse. Success. Things have, yeah. <clears throat> well, Mr. Hastings said earlier, he was talking about a self-correcting mechanism right. that would arise when you have full uh, disclosure both before and after, uh, especially with respect to travel, but also meals and so on. And that's what I would suggest, that rather than an independent committee, uh, and I think I, I agree with Congressman Edwards on this, the, uh, the kind of, of scrutiny you would get from the full disclosure would create its own uh, but committees right, of- But right, right now, if I, if I took a privately funded trip, I have to disclose it. We go through a process, we have to file it, it's there, and then my, the reporters in my local newspaper usually do a bad story about, you know, trips that are taken, uh, you know, it's, it's not particularly sexy these days to talk about trips that are legitimate. I mean, they tend to focus in on the fact, try to, try to read, read between the lines, I think maybe because a few people have abused the right. So that is there. Um, 
I guess what I'm concerned mm -hmm. about is a, a member of Congress, you know, can, can kind of put down anything he or she wants as to what they learned on that trip and what they did. Um, I mean, it would seem to me that there should be a pre-approval process before you go on that kind of trip where there is some entity. Now, I was saying to Mammy, if we could do it, you know, within the House, fine. But some entity that says, look, you know, this, this is legitimate travel or this mm -hmm. doesn't pass the smell test. You know, um, you know, we need more information. Um, and, you know, and even getting to the point of, you know, uh, doing a little bit more oversight into who's sponsoring the trip. You know, um, is this uh, group actually legitimate or is it a front group or something else? Yeah. I mean, I think that's the kind of stuff we want to make sure that uh, we avoid in the future. Yeah, I, just yeah. one final point. That's, I think that's all uh, accurate. I would agree with it. And the, my experience was uh, in putting together a trip this past summer um, uh, at Pepperdine School of Public Policy was that we actually were told to ex extend out a little bit more the, uh, the panel discussion so that there was less free time in the afternoon because right. the, the folks who were uh, reviewing it thought it was a little bit too much time. So there was already that kind of, uh, of review and, and feedback that affected the nature of the actual program. Who gave, who gave you that, who, who told you to expand the program? Um, I think it was staff on the Ethics Committee, okay, House good, Ethics good. Committee, yeah. Mr. McGovern, um, with respect to private travel, um, if the committee with has, that has jurisdiction over the activity, the, ever the, the quote, business purpose of the trip is discussed, if the committee of jurisdiction, in effect, which knows what's going on in those areas, says it's a legitimate trip, if that's the pre-clearance pre system. Would you require the chairman and the ranking minority member to both have to agree? Before I would they, think so, yes. Okay. Right. I mean, if, you know, I, I think if, if what we need is if, if there's something like if they clear it, that makes, makes, makes it a legitimate trip. Mm. And to me, the best way to do it is not to have an outside source. I agree with, I think, uh, several other members of the panel. I mean, if the, if the House wants to do this, they can do it, and they will do it. And it's difficult, and, you know, it's always... You know, uh, in the past, somebody else let something go so we can let it go now or uh, waive right. the rules or anything else. But the fact of the matter is, these we were having trouble with waiving rules when I was on the Rules Committee staff and Lou Deschler was deciding what went to the floor well, or not. Let me, know, let me tell you, those three, things are, and, and those things continue to right. happen and they continue to grow sometimes. Right. And the body does need to decide to take a step right. and say, we're not going to do it anymore right. if that's what they want to do. Right. But from a standpoint of traveling, the question is, if, a, if the committee of jurisdiction over that area of, of congressional business says, looks at it and says it's a legitimate trip, that's a pretty darn good check. And again, I mean, I, I raised the issue, you know, about an independent um, review board simply because, um, I mean, I'm worried about the fact that people are losing confidence in this place. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I you know, I mean, it's, it, you know, you go to any diner in my district, and the, and the talk is about the latest scandal here, you know, about somebody taking it, you know, advantage of the system. And people have had it. I mean, they really have. And so part of what, you know, what I hope comes out of all of this is that, you know, that, that whatever we do, that it, it, it somehow satisfies the skepticism and, and, and deals with the cynicism that so many people outside of the Beltway have. And, you know, and, and, with, and with some good reason. And with some good reason. There are very good honorable people here, but, you know, for, on too many occasions, uh, this place has looked the other way. And so in many ways, the erosion of these rules or the lack of enforcement, you know, it, it, we're, we've all been complacent and we're, you know, and we're, and we're all kind of complicit uh, by the fact that we haven't insisted, you know, and demanded that, in fact, these rules be enforced. And, um, and I think, you know, so I, I, I wear, I'm, I'm also trying to deal with the public perception, which I think is also important, in addition to kind of cleaning up the house here. Yeah. Well, my colleague, sure, uh, you know, just very briefly, and uh, you know, I, I recognize that you've used a lot of time and I won't. Uh, th that said, uh, I just want you to recognize, uh, Jim, that you're kind of mixing um, issues, um, a, a process and travel. And while it may be interrelated, for example, uh, the analogies that you use are uh, regarding legislation, as you and I and everybody in here knows, uh, did in fact occur. Those people didn't travel uh, that made those decisions regarding um, uh, the matters that came in the dead of the night. They didn't travel to Australia or Africa. They came from Northwest Washington. 
And I just want yeah. you to <laughs> but, I, but, I, but I would guess, you know, I mean, I think some of those people who have, who have made some bad decisions, you know, may have gone on golf trips to Scotland and a few other places. So it's, uh, that may not directly be related to that legislation. Let me just say one other thing, and, and then I'll let you, I'll let you, I mean, on the issue of travel and lobbyists, I mean, I, I, I agree with uh, what Mr. Darrow has said. Um, we've got to be very careful on, you know, on how we uh, try to limit that. Uh, you know, save the children, for example, um, you know, um, employs a lobbyist. Um, but does that mean that save the children shouldn't be able to sponsor a trip, you know, to uh, Darfur, <laughs> so, you know, or, or to, you know, to learn about hunger in, uh, in some of the, uh, uh, and, and, and show people the results of the genocide out there? I mean, I, I think, you know, it, it seems, we, we have to understand that there's some, um, there are consequences to our, uh, to, to, to a kind of a general ban uh, on any uh, travel that by, by a group that hires a lobbyist. I'll let you. And, and I, would, uh, I would agree with that. And, and a problem with trying to carve it out is say that you say, okay, no lobbyists. So the Save the World lobbyist whom you know who right. uh, is here uh, can't come, but the person who signs his or her check right. can come with you. Right. Uh, and if that's not the case, do you ban any organization that has uh, any lobbyists, at which point you're banning, you know, United Way has lobbyists, the Red right. Cross has lobbyists. Uh, there are lots of bona fide uh, educational and charitable groups that have uh, lobbyists. And I want to, uh, I think Mr. Hastings brought this up well, what you're focusing on, I think appropriately, is the process. Uh, there are standards in place, perhaps the standards need to be beefed up. Uh, there's enforcement uh, that, sh that you, you're bringing up here as to whether uh, this body is properly enforcing <laughs> Uh, these standards rather than the trips themselves. The trips themselves, bona fide educational trips that meet these standards, uh, are, uh, should be permissible and should be allowed. Uh, and I think what you're rightfully focusing on is uh, the enforcement uh, mechanism. I'm, 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 what I'm simply suggesting is that, you know, all of us should be where you are and you should be saying, physician, heal thyself. Um, because the fact of the matter is that, um, you know, uh, a lot of these issues that we're dealing with um, have more to do with how we behave and how we enforce or, or don't enforce rules uh, more so than the fact that uh, you know you have you have these pretty you have these trips that have educational value to them so I thank you thank you all very much I think I think was, this is a good panel mr. sessions thank you chairman uh, I see this less of a goo ball and more something that we ought to work through that we could articulate the things which do not isolate members of Congress that allow us to openly, evenly, equally go and see things around the world. I think that there's one thing we shouldn't do is isolate members of Congress. I don't think we should isolate the world or people from members of Congress. I think that's important for both sides. Uh, I do, however, believe we ought to follow the rules. And so the first question I ask is what's wrong with the rules we got today? Anybody? I, Congressman, I, I don't think the problem is with the rules. The, the only problem is whether or not uh, they can be enforced uh, more adequately. Several of the people here today have said, and I agree, uh, that you know having in place a pre-approval process and, and a review process afterwards to make sure the agenda was followed and, and so forth you know, is helpful. Uh, but that doesn't require a change yeah. in the rules. So in other words, those that choose to take 27 trips and don't fill out their paperwork, that's the problem then. Mm -hmm. Not those that do fill out their paperwork and try and follow the rules. Well, it, uh, again, there have been some trips that we all know that were really not business trips. Or at least questionable. Very questionable okay. sometimes. And those, you know, that's, there are, there are some of that, but most most of the trips obviously are are very important. Whether you know it's whether it's a uh, an official trip, obviously important, or it's a uh, a private private organization that you're, where you're going to learn something useful, and uh, and and those ought to be authorized. They ought to be pre-cleared, and they ought to be checked afterwards. And you ought to be make, have to make sure that. Uh, the uh, information about the trip is on a website, publicly available, and uh, that settles it. I think that okay. Well, it. with that said, let's suppose I completely agree with you because I think that that is a very sound statement. Do you think that there 
is anything inherent than a trip, let's say, from the Aspen Institute or Heritage or APAC that would make them more educational or different than perhaps somebody that goes up to visit New York to see the financial services market? Is there a difference there? Same, same type standard, same type rules, equity? The only difference might be in the nature of the uh, connection between the sponsoring organization and some particular piece of legislation. It could, it, it, the latter example, going up to New York and maybe seeing the stock exchange or something like that, might actually be more likely to be uh, directly connected to some ongoing legislative uh, debate. What we do can be connected, but it's more from a 30,000 foot perspective than d down in the weeds of saying yay or nay on a, on a given bill, which we, we, we can't do. Okay. Let, let's say I do understand that. Let's apply it then to going to the Arctic Wildlife Refuge. Would that be 30,000 feet or would that be specifically related to a specific piece of legislation that we should look at it differently? In my testimony, um, Congressman, I did mention the uh, benefit of having uh, a member being able to go up there and have it, the trip be sponsored by, say, the Sierra Club or the American Petroleum Institute and not have it be relegated just to a government monopoly where the only sponsored trip could be by the Department of right. Energy. So I, I think those kinds of things, Yucca Mountain, uh, a certain type of maybe specialty hospital, you know, things that, that do relate directly to decisions you have to make as members, uh, you ought to be able to have a, as free a flow of information as possible to make the most informed decision. Okay, so let's stay with me. <laughs> so let's go back to the New York then. Mm -hmm. See, if we've decided that if you can go up uh, on either Petroleum Institute or someone else to Alaska, which he says, okay, now give me that same balance for the financial services trip that is related to a piece of legislation. Well, I think members ought to be able in front of legislative debates to learn firsthand um, about aspects of, the, of that debate, whether my, it's, it's a site I think, visit, I think for my example. point is, sir, and I'm mm -hmm. really working with you and you're working with me. Mm -hmm. If you go up to New York, the presumption is you're really up there to learn and get a one-sided story, but if you go to Alaska, you got a balanced view. That's what I'm trying to ask. How do you still get a balanced view of going to New York to looking at the financial markets, but to where someone doesn't mm -hmm. say, oh, you were obviously up there to pass this blatantly supportive bill of the financial service industry? How can you get the same view going to New York that you got to Alaska is my question. I'm not sure there should be a requirement that it be a balanced view. If, if the Sierra Club were to take a group, a CODEL, up to um, uh, ANWR, one would imagine that the, the type of uh, exposure, the type of briefings you'd receive would be different than if it was the American Petroleum Institute. And that would be true of any trip, say, to a financial institution so, as well. I, I heard you say whether the uh, some environmental group or some oil Right. group who might be have an opinion on one side of that issue, that's okay because you got a chance to go see it and if they were maybe slightly mm -hmm. biased in one way or another, that's okay. And it's okay to see the financial market in New York, right. same level playing field. Right. And when you're talking about disclosure, you would be able, you would be posting your, the agenda for that trip. Yes, sir. Say on your website, for example, both pre and then after the trip to confirm that it actually took place in the way it was uh, designed. And, and that would be uh, then out in the public realm for your constituents and for the media to evaluate. And, and if, if a member was taking just one side of an issue all the time, maybe someone would, you know, critique them and say, you should go see the other side of this issue. And it would be more of a free-flowing public um, uh, disclosure and debate about that. By the way, I agree with you. I just wanted to make sure there wasn't a difference between going to New York or going to see right. something else. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. May, may I? No, I'd, I'd like to just add one thought to that. We're, we're talking about private travel, privately funded travel. Uh, but it's also good to remind uh, uh, committee chairs and so forth, you know, that it's beneficial to have as much government funded travel, committee sponsored travel, uh, as possible too. When I was on the uh, uh, Education and Labor Committee, we made very non glamorous trips to visit strip mining sites. <laughs> and things, you know, uh, not with the point of view, bipartisan trips. Uh, I think that uh, encouraging an increase in the number of trips by the committee members, official trips, uh, is also a beneficial thing. 
I would uh, I would add, uh, and Mr. Edwards and I both agreed in our statements that uh, that depending upon congressional uh, federally financed trips uh, in order to expand uh, the knowledge of members and staff is not something that is reasonable in tough budgetary times. I think that the crux of the issue uh, is the, is a qualitative one. Uh, is the member going to Alaska spending 20 hours uh, hiking up and down the, the pipeline or the non-pipeline looking at caribou, uh, or is it uh, three hours of that and 18 hours of hunting and fishing? Uh, is the member in New York meeting with, uh, with brokers and with uh, financial titans and, and, uh, and others, uh, or are they spending all their time uh, going to shows in Broadway? Uh, and as uh, Mr. Hastings had said about the trips that uh, some Jewish organizations do to Israel, uh, those trips are, uh, are uh, hours and hours packed of one meeting after another after another from the moment they hit the ground to the moment they leave. So it's a qualitative uh, look uh, that, uh, that the Congress should take at the trips that their members are seeking approval for uh, both before and after. Good. I want to thank each of you for being here today. I am sorry I had been on the floor doing another rule uh, and did not have the benefit of hearing your testimony. However, I felt like this engagement with, was worthy of my time, and I want to thank you for yours. I yield back to the Chairman. Mrs. Matsui. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I want to thank all of you, the panel, for being here today. I, it's really been an interesting discussion, and uh, I think all of us here can agree on some common sense types of things that have to be done. Unfortunately, you can't squeeze common sense a lot of times into some rules. and. Um, Rules can be strict, but over time they get expanded. And I think that's the unfortunate um, case in many of these egregious activities that took place. I am a new member of Congress. In fact, tomorrow is my first year anniversary. And I am touched with my constituents an awful lot. And um, I am saddened by the fact that um, they are really very cynical about Congress. And I know, uh, Mr. Edwards, I've known you from before when my husband served in the Congress. And it's a noble profession. I don't think any of us would be involved in this activity unless we felt we could do some good. And it's unfortunate that um, our constituents, and a lot of people feel this way, and particularly young people. So even though I feel that we seem to always examine our navel a lot about this, it is important to, that we discuss this and it's important because of the way the American people feel about this that we do something. And we look at it very clearly and understand that this is a world where we really need to see, talking about trips, what goes on in other parts of the world. But I also agree it should be qualitative. Uh, it's work. We have to look at it as work. And um, I feel that anything that I do, I have to look at in the prism of my constituents in Sacramento and how it applies broadly to the nation. And I'm going to have to be very discriminating as we move forward because I don't want the American people to feel that we don't care about how we feel about ourselves and how the rest of the nation feels about us because we can't do our job unless we have the faith of the American people. Now, I don't want to be tied up with all kinds of you know, complicated rules. We understand that's not going to work. Uh, Mr. Bauer probably has that understanding because he probably advises a lot of clients. So we have to have it stated fairly simply. But we also have to be very forceful in our enforcement, I believe, or at least in how we hold people's feet to the fire on this. And I think a lot of that depends on all of us as members of Congress, too. I think we have to look disdainful of on people who don't have those kinds of standards. And I think it's important for us to rise to those standards. And for us today, I, I also believe that the experience of TRIPS is really good. But it has to be educational, qualitative. It has to be something that is going to be of value to our constituents and our work here as members of Congress. And so I believe that we have to be discriminating, but we need help in that. We need to know about um, what these tri tri trips are going to be about, who's sponsoring them. I mean, and in fact, we have to make decisions many times very quickly. I would like to have that assistance. I want to know. 
I mean, I know about a lot of groups, but there are groups I don't know about. And it would be very, very helpful to see the agenda, the speakers, at least what we'll be covering. And that, to me, will be very helpful because it is our reputations here at stake and also the reputations of Congress. And we can have transparency, but we also have to answer for what we're doing. And for me, it's important that I clearly understand why I'm going to be taking this trip. You know, there are some intangibles, as you say, about getting to know people and all that. That is important. But you know what? We can't explain that to our constituents. We know that as our working process, as we to deal with each other. You know, I have been involved in this congressional family for a long time. And a long time ago, and I think Mr. Edwards knows this, we were able to get together because we were more, more bipartisan. So we shared a bowl of soup, and the kids got to know each other, the spouses got to know each other. That's missing right now, today. And yes, trips will help in that regard, but that's not a reason for us to have to look at the rules, in essence. We have to look at the rules and how we conduct ourselves because it's important for us in our jobs. It's important for the American people to have faith in what we're doing. So if we can do this in a way, I believe in transparency. We need to have enforcement in some way. Um, we also have to have as much information as possible for us as members of Congress to make that kind of decision. Honestly, we are very busy. We're going to, you can see here, we're going to all kinds of committee meetings and things like that. So for us even, for me in particular, I can speak for myself on this, for me to just look at, let's say, take place over a recess. Do I go on this trip or not? Should I go home and interact with my constituents or will I get valuable information on this trip? It has to be something of, it has to be a very high quality for me to say I'm going to do that. I'm going to be very discriminating, and I think all of us here will be, and it's going to be important moving forward that we continue that also. I don't want us to sort of relax again, because in this period of time, it is very important for the American people to gain back their confidence in us. And I particularly understand and compliment Mr. Edwards on his remarks because he's been there as a member of Congress, understands. And um, I think we have to hold ourselves as members of Congress to a higher standard. And that really means we need more information. We need to know what the trips are all about. Uh, and we need to be able to make the decisions with the information we have at hand. And um, I do really appreciate your being here. And I like us to figure out a way to do this. So we can have enforcement. We know what the rules are. And we can make decisions based upon uh, the information we're given. So thank you. Mrs. Capito. Thank you. I want to thank the panel as well. I know you've uh, been here for several hours, and I'll try to be brief. Uh, I think one thing that I've learned uh, sitting through the testimony and listening to the questions is there's no easy answer. There's no black and white here. There's a lot of gray area. And that's going to confuse all of us, I think, when we set, sit down and really decide which direction we're going to go. But I thank you for helping us work through some of those confusing areas. I have a question, a concern that I've heard from several of my colleagues about the travel aspect. If, if the travel, if we do ban privately funded travel, or if we do ban no gifts, will we then shift the burden, or not the burden, but the um, desire for travel, will we then shift it into the campaign account? Will they be paid for that way? And will that then put more pressure on us to raise more money so that we can travel more and not have the scrutiny that we're going to put on ourselves? I don't know the answer here. I'd like to have some opinions, if you have any opinion, or if you've all thought of that. Speaking from the perspective of the Heritage Foundation, I, if, the, um, if we tried to put on a, a policy panel, policy uh, forum outside of Washington, and the only way to get members to travel there was through their campaign accounts, I think we'd actually be a little reluctant to host that kind of an event. So I, I think it would, it would um, create a chilling effect on our ability to do anything really outside of Washington, in that sense. Anybody else? <coughs> Thank you.
Sorry for the awkward. That's okay. <laughs> you can't turn 360. <laughs> yeah, I'm happy. I, no, we're the House uh, recently provided for more flexibility for the use of campaign funds to support office-related activities. I'm not sure how widely known that is. I think that provides members with some additional flexibility so that if there is a close call, a close call, they would have that option. But I do agree that they would be entirely reluctant to pick up the entire burden, and understandably, of events now paid for with privately, other than by campaign, with their own campaign funds, because that, of course, means that monies they're raising under limits, hard to come by, um, would there would be all that much more than scarce supply. Mm -hmm. I, I personally would not, uh, you know, like the idea of uh, mixing the, the idea of campaign funds and, and official business. I think that's probably not a, a good idea. I also wanted to say to uh, Congresswoman Matsui that uh, uh, two things. One is, uh, first of all, we have talked about this being a, a very noble profession, and your husband was one of the reasons that uh, politics was such a noble profession. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm glad that you've been able, you know, to continue what he was doing. And, and in response to one of the uh, points that you made, I, I, I think a key here to satisfying the question that you asked uh, is to make sure that you're not only knowing who's funding the trips and who's going on the trips, but that the agenda is made pu made public in advance, that the members of Congress who, who pass judgment on the propriety of a trip know what the agenda will be, they know who the speakers will be, they know uh, what will be studied and, and who will make presentations and for how long, and that afterwards, uh, in the post review, you make sure that was done. So you know how much free time is built in and, and whether or not it's, it's too much. And I think that's something the Congress should insist upon. Thank you. In terms of the transparency, I'm all in favor of as much transparency as we can possibly um, create, uh, whether it's in our official life or in our campaign life. I think that, uh, you know, the ultimate um, decision maker on that, of course, is the electorate, your constituent. They see everything you're doing, they know where you're going, how your money's being spent, and they can make a judgment on that. I would have to say, too, as a member of Congress, I have used quite frequently the Ethics Committee to give me uh, the, a ruling on certain activities, whether it is my conduct in a parade, whether it is can I lend my signature to a certain letter uh, asking for um, to join in an uh, economic development seminar, uh, whether I can, uh, a staff member can, how much time a staff member can spend doing certain activities and where does that, can I pay a staff member to drive from here if they're going to do an official event, and a campaign event, you know, all these kinds of things that we deal with every day. I have found the Ethics Committee to be very useful in terms of yay or nay. And uh, so I think, you know, having some kind of oversight might be uh, a, uh, a pre-approval or something like that might be useful in terms of where you come up with these questions. So I think we have had a mechanism in the Ethics Committee to give us some assurances that we're going in the right way, especially in the area of campaign and official business. So I would like to say that. The other thing is I started thinking about this. I received an honorary degree at one of my local um, uh, universities, small university in my town the other uh, last um, cycle. Well, I consider that a gift but it doesn't have a monetary value. So now this particular school uh, decides that they want to create a certain program and they want some earmarked funds for their program. Well, where am I on that? I mean, I think that is a, uh, you know, have I received a gift? What's the worth of the gift? Is the hood worth more than $50? Is the paper worth more than $50? I mean, you know, we got to have some, some common sense here, but you can see where, where you start thinking about these things. Does anybody have an opinion on that? Was I'm it, now an alum. What, <laughs> was it a doctorate? Yeah. Of course it was. I got to be the law, a lawyer for a day. It was wonderful. <laughs> you know, I would think that uh, if the program that they're trying to create has a educational purpose in the university or the college. Uh, it's certainly something that is probably very legitimate. But it's probably also true that they thought about 
the program at right. the same time they thought about giving you the hood. Certainly, and I accept that. Yeah. And I'm a, you know, I'm an adult who can make decisions on, uh, you know, the legitimacy of certain programs and all that. But you, you can see what, what, I, what I'm thinking. It raises here. questions. Will, it, will the general lady yield? Yes. I can assure you, at the University of Oklahoma, they would have waited until you got the program before you got the doctorate. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm not really accusing this institution of anything or me of anything. Uh, but I do think that. You know, these are the kinds of questions that, that, that we deal with every day. Or my husband's alma mater, it's the only male school uh, still left on the East Coast, basically. I was the first female speaker. They gave me an honorary degree. Well, who pays for my trip over there? Can they pay for me to come over there? Uh, can they give me a gift as the speaker? I mean, all these kinds of things. There's no evil motive here. It, uh, maybe they were low on their list and couldn't find a man. I don't know. but. Um, <laughs> So I, these are the kinds of questions I think, and I'm, I'm not trying to make light of this, and I know that uh, I know that you all, but you know, it, every every gray area leads to another gray area, and I think at some point we either need a mechanism to clear all of this, or to um, I don't know, it, it just it leads to more confusion. I think we can find the answer. I really do. I would like to say, in terms of the Aspen Institute, I've never taken um, one of your trips, but I have heard uh, from numerous members who have who have said several things. Number one, extremely educational, working hard, and very bipartisan. And uh, to a person, uh, I think that they, and from what I've heard about those trips, I think it would be um, a disservice to this institution to uh, create a rule where those kinds of trips are no longer allowed. So I thank you all for your indulgence. Thank you. Yes, sir. Um, if I could just, uh, and do you prefer to be called doctor? Yeah. Doctor. <laughs> Doc, do, doctor, Madam Congresswoman. Uh, to your earlier point about uh, uh, clearing things with the Ethics uh, Committee, um, I think uh, an example uh, to show how our organizations uh, already do this uh, would be appropriate. The American Israel Education Foundation, uh, which sponsors trips to Israel, uh, scrupulously follows congressional rules, provides to members of Congress and their staff uh, information about uh, exactly what they're doing, what the purposes are, the, uh, as part of the whole recruiting, organizing, uh, planning, and financing of those trips. Uh, in the invitation letters that are sent to members, uh, the AIEF fully uh, discloses and describes the purpose of the foundation, its affiliation with APAC. The letter also describes the purpose of the trip, the key policy issues that will be uh, covered, and the kind of briefings and meetings that will take place. Uh, and then after the trip, uh, within three weeks of the trip, uh, the members or staff are provided with information uh, about what actually happened and about the, uh, any sort of costs that were uh, associated with it so that members can follow uh, the procedures, the rules that are in place uh, to talk to the Ethics Committee either in advance to make sure that the, the trip is kosher, as we would say, <laughs> um, but also uh, after the fact uh, to be able to, uh, to disclose fully exactly what happened. Okay, let me ask you, when you write the initial letter to the Ethics Committee, are you asking for an opinion there, or are you simply informing them? Uh, our organizations provide the information to the member, and the member can then decide uh, what he or she wants to do uh, with it as far as either looking for an opinion from, uh, from the committee uh, or just having it there so that they know that it's fully uh, within the scope. One other, uh, one of the standards that is in place is that uh, entertainment and recreational activities uh, according to the rule that's currently in place uh, are to be kept minimal or incidental. Uh, in fact, the AIEF uh, discloses in the letter that it will not pay for uh, the $20 uh, fee that a hotel charges uh, for use of the gym uh, at the hotel in Jerusalem. And members are told ahead of time that we don't consider this to be uh, within the scope. Uh, and if a member wants to use the gym uh, at the hotel, they need to pay for it themselves. And we're back to use of the gym. <laughs> there you go. Thank you. Mr. Cole. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, first, I want a, a tangential remark. I just want to make, I want to associate myself uh, with Chairman uh, Hastings' uh, remarks about participation of Ethics Committee members in this particular hearing. Uh, I think it's very valuable, very supportive of that. And I, I noted, uh, while I have a great deal of respect for, uh, for uh, Mr. Mullahan, uh, last year, a number of members of the Ethics Committee were involved in debates over rules that literally could have involved questions about uh, uh, mem member behavior. Uh, I didn't notice any hesitancy to engage in that debate. I thought it was appropriate, didn't have any problem with it then, don't have any problem with it now. So uh, again, I 
I appreciate anybody's concerns in that matter, but I, I don't think they're uh, well founded in this case. Let me uh, let me start, if I may, and take just a, a point of uh, personal privilege, as uh, Congressman Edwards alluded to in his remarks. I used to work for him. I was his. Uh, his district director, and uh, I can tell you, if uh, if no man's a hero to his valet, probably no member's a hero to their district director. And uh, <laughs> but uh, he came pretty close to violating uh, that uh, that rule. He was a uh, you know, one. I learned a great deal uh, from him in the time I had, and I just want to now take this opportunity, by the way, uh, Mickey, to personally apologize to you because I will tell you, as a district director, I used to think I need him in Ponca City to talk to Conoco. I need him to talk to these farmers uh, out in rural Kent County. I need him to take his 100th tour of Tinker Air Force Base. Instead, he wanted to go off on Aspen Institute trips and study uh, Russian relations. You were right. I was wrong. You made the right judgment. Uh, and I, having just returned from an Aspen Institute trip uh, with, uh, with Congressman uh, Obi, where we swap Mickey Edwards stories. Uh, I will tell you he is as personally charming uh, as you always said, but he is still politically incorrigible and philosophically misdirected. So he's been perfectly consistent with our joint uh, association with him. Um, you know, I, I want to make a couple of points, and then I really do have some, some questions. Uh, when I first got to Congress, a friend of mine told me, uh, remember, 95 percent of the mail that you get and 95 percent of the visits that you get are to the occupant. They're not really to you. Uh, and you need to remember that uh, for good or for ill. Not be flattered by it. Uh, also not to be put off by it because they have a right to talk to whoever the occupant of that office is and they have business to transact and they have points of view to argue and you need to be uh, open and, and accessible to that but uh, never think it's individual. I found around here you don't have uh, too little information or only one side. Frankly, it's, you get more information than you can possibly absorb from multiple uh, directions. And uh, the reality is sometimes uh, you have to make decisions who you're going to see versus who your staff's going to see versus, hey, we already know where we're at on that kind of issue. The idea that you sit there and see every single person with every point of view and then arrive at a decision when you already have a well-established position I think is a misdirected idea. It uh, doesn't mean you're not open. Usually in committee meetings, I can assure you, you're going to get every point of view because both sides call witnesses and people are there. So I don't think, uh, I don't think lobbyists uh, you know, somehow limit us or control the information. Usually we, we pick what we want. Uh, I also don't think that there is uh, too much recreation that goes on around here or in this process. The reality is any reasonable look at the hours that members put in traveling, uh, discussing, working uh, would, would suggest that this job, if it were paid, compensated by the hour, would be paid a lot better than it is. And most members, frankly, either made more money before they got here or can easily make more money in pursuing other things. So you've got to really want to do this job, frankly, to, to do it. The idea that you're sort of, um, uh, you know, attracted to it by uh, all the perks and all the privileges, uh, there's certainly some nice parts of it, but it's usually the experiences. I remember once on a on a Codell, uh, I spent two hours in the Libyan desert with Muammar Gaddafi. Thirty hours later, I was with Tony Blair at Number Ten Downing Street. I thought that was pretty cool, and all the money in the world couldn't have replaced that, nor the value of the experience, nor the appropriateness of the experience. So, uh, uh, you know, at least we give the American people the impression that uh, you know, on the one hand. Uh, this isn't work, it's all fun. That's clearly a misimpression. Or on the other hand, that it's not an enormous privilege to serve and you, you get some opportunities, honestly, that very few other people ever have a, a chance to, uh, to enjoy. Uh, you know, it's not too hard to uh, discover, my opinion, is the excesses that go on around this place. I think most people tend to know about it. I think the press does it. And I can assure you, as a guy who used to spend a career, uh, as a political consultant, I, I have enjoyed all of you, uh, you telling me uh, that uh, you'd love to put my opposition uh, research on my opponent's websites. I think that's great. Uh, I have no problem, by the way, with that particular suggestion, but if you think that listing it, uh, you know, quite often uh, you say that, you know, well, that way it'll be all above board. If you think the people reading it won't twist it 
and use it for something else, and you're being very naive about the political process because it will happen. An Aspen Institute trip to Jamaica isn't going to be said this was an educational excursion. It's going to be a trip to Jamaica that could be used politically if somebody wants to make that point. And I can assure you somebody will want to make that point if they feel I can do it. I mean, a lot of the discussion that goes on about this process is not intellectually honest. It's politically driven. Uh, and the lens through which you look at your potential opponents is usually not the lens of objectivity or giving that person the benefit of the doubt. It's an adversarial system. Politics is an adversarial process. Uh, and you have to understand that when you get involved in it. Having said, uh, you know, those things just kind of as premise, I, I do have some questions and, and some comments along the way. Um, uh, Mr. Hines, I was, I was uh, interested in your idea about committee uh, approval, Committee of Jurisdiction approval. And let me ask you a couple of things because it's an intriguing idea, but it's, it's got a couple of things that concern me. I mean, by necessity, that's going to be a partisan process. That is, the committee is not a, like the Ethics Committee, it's at least a 5-5 body. It's bipartisan by nature. Some committees operate in a very bipartisan fashion, you know, I would, and where personal relationships are very high. I used to be on the Armed Services Committee. I don't think you could find two finer people than Duncan Hunter or Ike Skelton or two people that, uh, you know, really, uh, really work together well. That's not true on every committee in Congress. Do you have any concern that somebody might uh, use the position of being a chairman to deny, uh, uh, you know, a, a ranking member or other members of the committee that have been on different sides of him uh, the opportunity to travel? Yeah, uh, of course that's a possibility, uh, Congressman, but I would, I would suspect that if you had a committee chair uh, who was being um, uh, just politically saying, in effect, the minority doesn't get to go on a trip they want to go on or something like that. Um, those are the kind of issues I suppose it can get solved at the leadership level. Um, I, I, I do remember many years ago when the Rules Committee, this committee, I don't know if it does anymore, had authority to provide travel authority to a number of committees that didn't have it at part of their basic jurisdiction. And one of the things this and this committee at that time was uh, uh, controlled by the uh, uh, now minority party. And one of the things that the committee did was in, as they dealt with that issue of, of, of travel authorizations, it came to the attention of this committee uh, that the some chairman were not providing minority staff for the minority members on a trip. And uh, we began to write that in on a bipartisan basis on this committee in order to assure that if there was a dis the dispute about uh, some issues that came up during the travel, that both party memberships who were on there had some staff people to draw together facts and figures and write report. So I suspect that the same kind of need to make sure that uh, we're, we're, you know, we're all treating each other fairly would probably be, be something that the leadership would want to make sure happened. I don't know it, but I would suspect that it would, it would be more likely to happen than it would not to happen, given the fact that uh, you're going to have a stink if you don't. Let me ask another question on meals and invite any of you that care to answer to answer and, and let me and, and maybe gifts too, although let me tell you I already have my lifetime supply of t-shirts and basketball <laughs> or baseball hats. Uh, I, I'm ready to, to immediately give up any more uh, with, with the exception of uh, if I'm in Iraq and, and I get a, a cap from uh, the 3rd Infantry Division, which I have one, I'm going to keep the, that cap. But any others, uh, I'm, I'm happy to give up. But uh, the meal question is an interesting question, and let me give you two examples and how you would answer it. Maybe one, uh, you know, I guess I'm not senior enough to be invited out to dinner by all that many lobbyists. Uh, who normally invites me out to dinner is the Norman Chamber of Commerce has come to town. It's their big time to be here. That's an important thing. They're talking about their needs or the Ada Chamber of Commerce. In other words, district people that are coming up in that capacity and that I represent. Another group that falls into that uh, category for me sometimes are maybe people are coming in town to go to an association annual meeting, uh, insurance people or something. And so they're given the, the job to do one of two things, either take me to their dinner that they're having as an association and I'm sort of there as their guest, 
or to take me out to dinner, usually with some list that they've been given that they don't know a whole lot about, but they, they need to ask me eight or nine questions. They're usually not with the lobbyists because there's not enough lobbyists to cover all the members, uh, you know, in a particular association. So that kind of thing, is that something that you would have a concern with? Um, and, and then I'm going to throw in two other kinds. La this, uh, this week I went to an APAC dinner. Uh, it was not a dinner with lobbyists. It was a group of thousands of people. Uh, Senator Collins was the featured speaker. Uh, I was at a table, really at, not even in this case with my constituents, uh, but with a group of people from Colorado who were absolutely charming and, uh, and a delight to talk to. And uh, certainly I'd had visits during the day from, uh, or the next day, I think, from folks associated with APAC, some from my, my area, uh, some not. Um, but obviously I'd gone to a dinner the night before and I'd had a dinner, uh, which I certainly didn't pay for. I was an invited guest. Is that something uh, that to be concerned about or that, you know, we just you shouldn't go or how would you pay? How would you handle something like that as opposed to a lobbyist taking you out to dinner to make a pitch on a specific piece of legislation? Go ahead, Mickey. Well, obviously, if you've got constituents, like the Norman Chamber of Commerce or someone from back home, it seems to me that's totally appropriate. Well, they're here to ask me for something. I mean, they'll have sure a long they list yeah. of requests. Yeah. And they're not all, you know, we want you to pass medical liability reform. It may be something very specific for Norman that would involve millions I, of dollars. I understand that. But, I mean, it strikes me, your constituents, I mean, they are, what they are doing is exercising a First Amendment right. I mean, they're sitting there and talking to you about what they want to, what they want to talk to you about, and they have a right to petition. So I see no reason at all to be concerned about but that. But we are That's doing it over a meal. Well, I don't no see problem. any problem there. Now, let me suggest this. If you're, if you're sitting in, uh, you know, if, if the meal comes out and you spend $300 for, you know, a bottle of wine or something like that, I mean, that, uh, that, that may be a problem for, the, for, uh, for everybody in that sense, the, you know, the, because the group did that. But it seems to me that as long as you're with your constituents, I mean, you, you really are listening to their grievances, so to speak, and you have a right to do that. You have an obligation to do that under the Constitution, really, I guess. So to me, any time you're with your constituents, you hope they're going to exercise judgment about where they go and what they do, uh, and you can maybe even remonstrate with them a bit to let's, you know, let's not have a $300 bottle of wine, mm -hmm. you know. But the fact I wouldn't know one if I tasted yeah. one, so. Well, <laughs> I wouldn't either. But when you're with your constituents, I think, you know, you can, you can almost just about, in effect, as long as you're within reason. I mean, on your website, it's going to say, I met with my, the Chamber of Commerce or the Reliance Club or the, or the nurses' organization or whatever it is. And that's absolutely responsible. That's one of your responsibilities. I see no problem there. Now, with respect to other groups, um, it comes down to judgment, I think, on your part and their part. But the fact of the matter is, if it's reported, and uh, if you're comfortable with it, and you're, you're able to say to your constituents, this was an important meeting. We were talking about issues that, uh, that this group was talking to me about that affect us, not only my responsibility, but affect you back home. And this is something that ought to be talked about. And I was talking to them when I was having dinner with them. I mean, if that's what it comes down to, if these large groups you know, conventions and all of that. I think most people are pretty sophisticated. I'll give you country. an example in a minute, but... But I, I think, you know, a lot of people are pretty sophisticated in this country. They, most, most people have some recognition that they're almost, almost anything in this country has organizations and associations and, and groups in town, whether you're talking about uh, any, uh, any kind of an organ, any kind of business or profession or uh, hobbies or almost anything else. And they recognize, I think, that you know, a lot of groups talk to Congress people. And you know, it's, if, if it's, uh, you know it, it's, you're damned if you do and you're damned if you don't in one sense because special interest groups are groups that I don't have any relationship with. And, and uh, citizens asking for some, some uh, to have an opportunity to visit with you are people who are, who are bringing up issues of importance to me back home. Well, first I want to say that uh, Mr. Cole has such high regard for this institution and has had 
you know, for probably his entire life. But even when he worked for me, and we, we spent a lot of time talking about history and poetry and a lot of other things, he still insisted on calling me congressman. It is a great honor for me to call him congressman. Uh, I also, though, want to say to you, Tom, that if by some miracle Oklahoma wins the Big 12 basketball championship, I'm going to get you a Big 12 championship T-shirt. <laughs> uh, so you'll have to accept. We will win uh, the women's. Yeah, that's true. But but I, I I just want to associate my, myself with those last remarks. Uh, the one thing you don't want to do is put up any barrier between constituents. Uh, and their representatives. You have to be able to, and it doesn't matter if they are pushing for a particular point of view, as they often will be. Uh, if they want to do it over lunch, uh, uh, I had many lunches with the Oklahoma City Chamber of Commerce and city council members. They had a point of view. Uh, but the one thing you have to do, there, there's a distinction between people who are not your constituents and who are trying to influence the process, which is one set of, of issues to deal with, uh, and then your constituents. And there should be no barrier whatsoever uh, that, that makes it difficult for your constituents to come talk to you in any forum uh, about what's on their minds. Let me ask you another related, because I want to walk, sort of walk down this road a little bit, and thank you for your indulgence, Chairman. Uh, uh, let me give you another example. Uh, I have in my district, which this probably answers the question, but just to give you the example, a large employer. They, this happens to me every year. They hold a convention in Las Vegas. They employ 600 people in eight Oklahoma. They have 15,000 people at their convention in Las Vegas because they're, they have sales associates from all over the country. Um, I get invited to go. I, you, frankly, what happens is I don't participate in gaming in that sense. So I go or golfing. Uh, I go leave the day of, you know, the night or the day before. I have dinner with the senior executives of that business, which is the second largest employer in the community that's located with that night. I give my 10-minute address the following morning, and I get on an airplane and go back either to home or back to my district. <coughs> it's uh, is that travel that is pro inappropriate, private, should be publicly funded, not done at all? Go ahead. You're with constituents, correct? Some constituents, now, yes, some but some not. That's right. But what you, the reason you are there is because the company is, has, located in my is a major employer of your constituency, and it itself is a major constituent and has interest and, and concerns that it has to bring to you that are peculiar to its success, which means the uh, some of the success of, of, of your constituents have got jobs. I mean, I, I would not see that as a, as a problem. As, lo as long as you go out there and you're talking to them, uh, the management, about issues that are going to be uh, important to them as they're going forward in their business located in your, in your district. I mean, that seems to be very legitimate. Again, you're... Uh, as the congressman said, uh, you should put nothing between yourself, and you wouldn't put your, anything okay. between yourself and your constituents. The fact that there are other people there at the meeting, the fact that uh, uh, they're doing some things you're not doing that are of a recreational nature doesn't change the fact that you're talking to your constituency. They may be the top management of the company, but they're still the people who have a, a tremendous impact on your district. I would go beyond that, Congressman. and hypothesize for a second that there were no constituents there, but it was a one time every year where a certain industry gathered 15,000 of its best and brightest people in one place. If it happens to be Las Vegas or some other uh, convention city, so be it. But if a chairman of a committee or subcommittee or a member of an authorizing committee or someone who uh, needs a little bit of uh, you know, consultation, be able to talk it out a little bit with those experts, is invited to attend the dinners and hear the presentations, that seems to be a legitimate free flow of information that we should not be uh, stifling. I would, uh, I would second that. Um, our uh, Jewish community federations and Jewish organizations uh, have uh, annual uh, meetings at all sorts of levels, national conferences, statewide conferences, city conferences, uh, and to have members of Congress come speak and attend and interact uh, with members, I think, is, uh, with members of those organizations is a, is a valuable public service for uh, citizens to be able to hear from you in a venue uh, other than uh, via C-SPAN. Uh, and I think that there's, there's a clear public interest in that, uh, even if there are no uh, registered voters from your district uh, in that room, or just a few. 
uh, I think there's certainly a number of, uh, uh, of uh, public policy issues uh, that you all deal with that uh, may relate to a, a subset of our, of our country that uh, has zero citizens in your district, uh, Native Americans, if you're not from Oklahoma, uh, for instance. Uh, and to be able to interact with, uh, with that population, uh, if there was a rule that said you must have a constituent in the room to be able to do this, I think would be uh, unwise. Yeah. Uh, well, you really answered second question. Another, another thing I, I think a lot about, uh, members of this committee know, I mean, I care a lot about Native American issues and tribal issues and tribal sovereignty. It puts me at odds occasionally with the majority of my own party or the majority of this institution. Uh, on the other hand, uh, you know, I get a lot of visits from tribes, not just from Oklahoma, because frankly, there's not a lot of people that understand their issues from their point of view uh, in this body. And, uh, uh, and sometimes, again, it's can you come out to dinner with you? Can you? We got this problem. Our own people in our own state don't understand our problem. Will you sit down and talk to us? You might be able to help us, or you might be able to talk to them. You get a fair amount of that around here. Uh, but I can tell you, in every one of the instances I've gone through, if I took off my public servant hat, and put on my political consultant hat, I promise you I could eviscerate you. You know, I could make you, you're in Las Vegas partying, you know, you're doing, uh, you know, let's take, if, if I deal with Boeing, Boeing has a huge uh, presence just outside Tinker Air Force Base, uh, contract private employees. Uh, if I go to Seattle, spend time with Boeing or something, you know, that could be, not that I ever have, but uh, that could be misconstrued. So you, you do run these risks. Let me ask you a real broad question, and because um, it's a personal opinion question. Right now we're having a, a big debate in Congress, you know, over whether or not we're a corrupt institution or whether we have individuals that are corrupt. There's a big difference. Uh, and frankly, there are aspects of that debate that are politically motivated. And I, I say that not judgmentally because I've been in majorities and minorities at different levels of governments, and I will tell you minorities always uh, you know, think they're being abused and are always certain that decisions are being made that are inappropriate, that they're not involved in. Majorities are always exasperated and don't want to put up with all this questioning. It's not an unusual process. Uh, but there's, again, there's a big difference between the normal prospect, process and political tension and individuals who have transgressed, which I think happens on both sides all the time, uh, and an institution that is fundamentally broken. Uh, you have a judgment as to which situation or, or someplace in between that we're at right now? Well, I have an opinion. I, I don't think this institution is corrupt. I don't think it was corrupt when, when the other party ran it. Uh, I think there always have been problems. I think it's uh, uh, probably the best legislative body on the face of the earth, most open, uh, most responsive to, uh, to the voters. Uh, so, you know, that's one thing. I don't, I, I think the problem is with some you know, in an institution this size, there will always be some, some bad people. And that, that is another point I want to make. It is important to be concerned if there is a public lack of confidence. As I said in my remarks, that has to be addressed. But you can't be driven by it. The, this institution has to do what is right in order to be able to best do your jobs, to gain the information that you need, to be able to uh, to have enough perspective to make intelligent decisions, uh, and you can't be driven by uh, reporters or talk shows or anybody else, you know, creating a sense in the public that is not, not accurate. And so uh, it would be a real mistake to over-respond you know, to some of the criticisms that are leveled, whether it's by another political party or by a, a newspaper columnist or whatever else. If gathering information, uh, having the ability to get together in a bipartisan way, uh, having the ability to uh, talk to experts and, and enhance your knowledge uh, helps you do your job better as representatives, you know, then that's what you need to do uh, because uh, uh, the, the public will always uh, I mentioned earlier, you know, that if you tried to have all of these trips paid for out of public funds, uh, the constituents would not like it. I remember uh, when I was in the House and when we were paid, when I first came uh, here, uh, congressional salaries were much, much lower. Uh, and if you had a vote 
in by which the members of Congress voted to increase their salaries, constituents would very get, get very upset. So if you change the process, so an outside independent group recommended what the salaries of members of Congress should be, then you were attacked for you know passing the buck and not dealing with it. So you, you can't overreact to uh, uh, the kinds of pressures that come out of the media. You, you, you've got to do what you think is right. Mike? Um, I'll give you the philosophical think tank answer. Congressman, um, a lot of the, uh, the scandals that are in the front pages now and that are the focus of a lot of these uh, of reforms, in our view, stem from just how large government's gotten and how many kinds of things government's trying to do. And for every government program, for every um, area of uh, government engagement, there is now a building full of lobbyists and trade associations and experts, and there's analysts and think tanks that analyze it, and there's a lot of activity that revolves around things that the federal government now is doing in many cases that it wasn't doing 10, 20, 30, 40 years ago. So you've seen this correlation, the growth in lobbying, the growth in money spent on uh, not only education but also advocacy uh, that correlates with how large uh, Uncle Sam has become. So in some ways it's, it's a, you know, up in the, it's a pie in the sky solution perhaps, but the, the smaller we can make the government, the less the government would do, the less temptation there would be and, and the less opportunities there would be, fewer opportunities for these kinds of things to happen in the first place. I think you're absolutely correct. Actually, uh, uh, Congressman Hastings made that point brilliantly last week in our discussion. It was mentioned early on that $4 million was spent to, quote, lobby every member of Congress. But if you look at the total expenditure, we each member would under that formula be responsible for $5.8 billion worth of spending. So it's actually a rather right. modest amount of money given the, the size of the, the right. institutions and the amount of money. Let me make two points and then I'll, uh, I'll uh, yield back, Mr. Chair. First of all, I, I just want to tell you, I have been on, uh, uh, you know, many heritage trips. I have been on many Aspen Institute trips. Uh, I don't think I've actually been on an APAC trip since I've been in Congress, but I had the opportunity to go on one as a Secretary of State from my home state of Oklahoma. Uh, and I will tell you, they are absolutely invaluable. They are first rate. They're exactly the way these things ought to be done. Uh, anybody that tells you that the associations you make in those are not worthwhile simply has either never done it or is being uh, misingenuous in their their attacks. Uh, I'm a big believer in the, the point that you all made about pre-approval and full disclosure. I think that these are not hard to figure out the legitimate ones from the illegitimate ones. I don't think we need a year to think this through. I don't think we need multiple rules, uh, and I'm quite willing to to consent to a bipartisan, equally balanced body. The Ethics Committee would be my choice, but I'd look at anything else uh, as an appropriate place for those decisions to be made on a bipartisan basis. If you want to set the bar high, make it two-thirds or three-quarters of them. Members have to agree to a pre-approval. Uh, there's certain kind of, you know, a, under that kind of system, an APAC, an ASPEN, a Heritage would never, ever have a problem. There were, and, and the places that did would probably get the extra scrutiny. And if you require us as members to vote on each individual one and be held responsible, not something I would particularly like, Chairman Hastings, but uh, we would probably exercise a really high degree of scrutiny because we would have approved something that was inappropriate on a bipartisan basis. Um, and, and I think uh, putting some, I, I agree very much with Congressman Edwards' remarks about we need to be in charge of our own affairs. We need to govern ourselves. We're certainly capable of doing that. Um, uh, last point, I really am concerned that we are in a process here uh, where we may end up with a politically driven result. We have a lot of people that are worried about November. I, th I thought, Mike, uh, you made an excellent point. I mean, literally, we could end up passing something that will uh, prevent the new, not yet elected freshmen from going to a Heritage Foundation orientation, a Harvard Foundation orientation. I attended both when I was a uh, a freshman, partly, uh, and specifically Harvard, honestly, to meet my Democratic colleagues. Uh, and a number of them came to the Heritage Foundation, sort of like my friend Mr. McGovern, who never darkened your door again, but he did want to sort of know who we were. And, I, you know, I laud him for that. I think that's a terrific thing to have done. Um, and to lose that uh, and to set that precedent for even a short period of time, because I promise you, if we do it for a year on a moratorium or whatever, in my opinion, it will be very hard to go back. We're not going to solve it in the year. We'll just wait right to the end and fight about it some more. Uh, and uh, if there were, uh, heaven forbid from my point of view, a change of parties in the, in the interim, it would become almost institutionalized that somehow that was part of it, that, uh, you know, that had to do with the change. And it will be very, very difficult 
to reestablish this. I would rather work around the edges, strengthen the, the pre-approval and the full disclosure mode, make us responsible as members of this institution for both our individual decisions and our collective decisions in approving the activity that we allow our members to engage in and then go on from there. And I, you know, I think you do that, we can get through this. I, I do not, uh, but right, right now I'm not convinced that we're going to have that kind of discussion. Uh, I said last week, and I'll say it one more time for the record, I am convinced at the end of the day we'll have a bipartisan bill. It'll either be a bipartisan good bill that, the, that everybody can uh, say that works pretty well and they can celebrate, or it'll be a bipartisan bad bill, which is you keep uh, throwing up suggestions, you're going to have to live under them. You can't attack a bill publicly and then privately say, thank goodness you guys didn't do what we asked you to do. We'll drive right down to that level. And the easiest thing is, I mean, you know, the easiest thing is to go home and say, we just ended private travel. You can never, ever happen again for anybody. Now, I can defend that in any town meeting in my district. Uh, but that's not good for the institution. That's not good for the country. And, uh, and frankly, uh, once you do it, I think it's real hard to come back from it. So I, I, go right ahead. If I could just uh, jump onto your remark there about uh, the discussion about a moratorium on travel. Uh, that has been proposed by some through the end of the year or, or whatever the specifics are of it. Uh, we, uh, as I said in my opening remarks, we do believe that that is unwise, uh, not just for the, the sort of political reality that you pointed out, uh, but also because the world is ever changing and events are taking place in the global community uh, that our elected officials should have the opportunity uh, to see uh, and to. I'll give you one even better as a very practical, fiscally conservative Republican. Uh, I, I know from my discussions with uh, Dick Clark at the Aspen Institute, for instance, that hundreds of thousands of dollars have already been committed, uh, you know, in advance for, you know, reservations for where they have planned their seminars. They planned those on the basis of the rules as they existed. Changing the rules in the middle of the game and sticking the bill uh, to a perfectly legitimate uh, private institute I think is inappropriate. And I don't think that's right. I'm sure that has happened with many other groups that have also on their schedule. If you're afraid of doing it, don't go on the trip. You know, if you're worried about the politics of it or you got some doubt, don't do it. Uh, but I, again, I've yet to see the member, honestly, who in the end lost because they went on an APAC trip, an Aspen trip, a Heritage Foundation trip, or anything that's like that. You know, uh, it's just they're not hard to defend if they're legitimate to begin with. And if they're not, you're going to run a risk. And the risk is not just enforcement. Uh, and we see the enforcement at least to some degree works because we've got some people going to jail and we've got some other people with serious problems. But I will promise you there is a legion of political consultants out there on both sides of the aisle who, uh, who certainly know how to find the records that exist and certainly know how to twist them to their advantage. And uh, uh, they are, and the press, a mechanism of enforcement every bit as, as terrifying to most politicians as the institution itself. Let me, let me also just make one point uh, responding to, to Mike Frank's uh, uh, think tank comment, uh, and that is as an executive of one of the nation's largest charities that's involved in, in uh, social services, um, it is not uh, those who are lobbying on uh, Medicaid reform, uh, it is not uh, those of us who are lobbying for uh, funds for uh, naturally occurring retirement communities uh, who are the ones who are engaged uh, in, in what are in fact uh, outrageous abuses uh, of the travel rules. So I would uh, just state for, state for the record that um, to blame this on a uh, burgeoning uh, federal uh, budget um, where, uh, where, in fact, uh, shouldn't, shouldn't be used as an excuse to, to reduce uh, innovative uh, responses to social service programs that, that have public financing as a component of them. If I can make one, one quick comment. For, well, first of all, let, let me just say that. Uh, a moratorium would be harmful, uh, as you suggest, but uh, it's also not necessary. Uh, the, the, this institution is quite capable with the committees that it has. Members of the Ethics Committee are here. Uh, if a separate committee uh, were to be established, you know, quite capable of implementing and, and the rules and doing the follow-up without a moratorium. Uh, and, but I want you to make one additional comment about what you said. There is a lot of pressure. You, you, you brought up the issue of politics, and there, there is a lot of pressure uh, on the leadership of this institution. There's a lot of pressure on the speaker uh, not to leave the majority party vulnerable to attacks uh, for not having adequately uh, reacted to the, the public impression. Uh, that makes it difficult, but the, but the leadership of the institution is not just the leadership of a political party. 
It is a leadership of one of the three separate and completely equal branches of government. Uh, and it is the obligation of the leadership to do what is right for the institution uh, and, and not simply react to what might be politically advantageous. And what's right for this institution is to keep open the opportunities for members to grow, be informed, uh, and so forth. So, you know, I, I hope that uh, uh, the speaker and other leaders will keep that in mind. You know, self-defense in politics uh, is not the only way to make really fundamental decisions that affect the ability of this institution to operate. Dr. Gingrich. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and, and I want to thank the, the witnesses. I think you have given us some great insight today, and, and uh, it, it, it sounds like to me that uh, you're not too much uh, different uh, in your opinions. Uh, there may be a little uh, in regard to the, the, the meals, and uh, like my good friend uh, uh, Tom Cole, I don't get invited out to any of these expensive meals and p probably wouldn't recognize, uh, recognize them that if I, I, I were invited, I, it's more policy and pizza maybe from Mike Frank and the Heritage Group, uh, which I enjoy. Uh, but uh, I think that what, what I've heard all of you say, whether we're talking about meals or whether we're talking about travel or, or whether we're talking about uh, uh, having a lobbyist go along in a, in a situation where there's some very, very important public policy information. Uh, I think the point about uh, you can't always just assume that if you, if you ban all private travel that the information that you receive from an agency of the government would necessarily always be uh, fair and balanced. Uh, so I want to ask this one question of all of you. Uh, and, and Tom touched on it just a little bit uh, as he concluded. I'm concerned about this race to draconia, if you will. Uh, I wish the uh, members uh, of the minority were still with us. They generally are, and I'm sure they all had conflicts. Uh, because I want to say to them, uh, as I did last week, I think this rules committee of, of uh, 13 of us, we have the capability we clearly have the capability in a very bipartisan fashion. Indeed, we have uh, two or three members of the uh, Committee on, on Standards of, uh, uh, of Ethical Behavior uh, in, on this Rules Committee. And we could do this in a very bipartisan way without uh, uh, being uh, overly draconian. But I'm, I'm afraid that that's not going to happen. Uh, I'm, a, I'm afraid we're, uh, because of political, uh, reasons and an upcoming election uh, that it's going to be uh, so far reaching uh, because of one upsmanship or the possibility of that. Uh, I would like to know uh, what each of you feel about that and what your concerns are because I think that you, you're talking, uh, we've been here a long time this morning, and, and you're talking, I think, uh, of doing things that are, are reasonable and fair and balanced. Uh, indeed, I think our ethics committee, uh, led by uh, Chairman Hastings, uh, with 5-5 five, five, uh, makeup, uh, as you all know, uh, it perfectly capable uh, of, of enforcing the rules that we have. Uh, but un unfortunately, uh, I'm concerned that that's not what we're going to have at the end of the day, and I'd like for you to comment on that. Uh, I, would, I would just start, uh, Dr. Gingrey, by saying that um, uh, there is a, a vehicle um, in the Senate bill that is uh, uh, being considered, was considered yesterday on the floor and, and is on the calendar again today uh, that we believe, that the United Jewish Communities believes, uh, has a reasoned approach, a bipartisan approach, uh, to reforming uh, these issues, particularly as it deals uh, with travel. Uh, and one that uh, has uh, the disclosure and the pre-approval and the, the post-review that we've been discussing. Uh, and uh, you know, it's, it's for this body to, to figure out how to work your uh, procedural magic. Uh, but uh, assuming that the Senate comes out with a bill, uh, that would be a vehicle uh, that perhaps you and your colleagues could use to rally around and, and move it to approval. The, uh, well, first I, I, I would, make the point that I, I appreciated your, your 
comment about the executive branch. You know, the executive branch has its own agenda, and it is a different branch. Uh, it is a separate branch, and uh, uh, taking trips that are uh, paid for by the executive branch, uh, even though that's government funded, uh, is no assurance, you know, of neutrality or getting even a straight answer. I, as I, as I always found from the executive branch, they would not lie to you if you were smart enough to know the right questions to ask, which sometimes uh, we would not be. Uh, I, you know, I would just repeat, um, you know, what I said earlier. I, I, there, there, uh, there is a drive politically uh, that I think raises the danger that. Uh, both the uh, uh, Democratic Caucus and the Republican Conference, uh, including members who think that the current system is not uh, all that bad, just needs enforcement, but, but that will drive them to make changes that are unwise, uh, that are counterproductive uh, in order to uh, avoid being, you know, the bottom person in the one-upmanship. Uh, I think that would be, you know, a very, very serious mistake. There are times in this institution when it is important to remember the dignity of the institution uh, and to not get caught up, you know, solely in the political battle. Uh, there, I have seen times, uh, and you have seen times, when the, this institution has had self-inflicted wounds because it was so concerned uh, about what the public perceptions uh, have been and as a, as a consequence, uh, has the, the Congress and the House uh, in particular have become less consequential, less able to do, do its job as uh, the representatives of the American people. Uh, some people in the institution have always felt that they were uh, staff members of the White House. Uh, if it was of their party. Uh, some have always felt that they, it was their obligation to oppose uh, the White House if it was the opposite party, um, and, and uh, to try to please whatever uh, some newspaper columnist was trying to do. This is really a time when you have to rise above that. If you deprive members of Congress from the ability to really know uh, as much as they can about the issues they're going to deal with and to form the relationships they need to form with people who might belong to another party. You're going to do very serious damage to this institution. And I think that's something that the caucus and the conference really need to keep in mind. Well, Congressman Edwards, if just uh, reclaim my time for just a second. I, I think what was said just a minute ago is that it, it, it is not a corrupt institution. Right. I think there are, there are certainly there are individuals that uh, uh, have have given us a bad name, uh, but I do not believe, I, and I hope you would agree with me, but it's the institution itself is not not corrupt. The others. One observation I would add to what Congressman Edwards said is that the uh, lodestar today, I guess, among on this panel seems to be transparency and disclosure, uh, and we've offered a lot of ideas on that. Uh, transparency is not an ideological concept. It, it's uh, it's basically a value that we can, I think, members of all uh, philosophical approaches can, can agree on. And if you listen to the member statements today, if one were to get a transcript and cobble it all together and try to translate it into a legislative proposal here, I think you, you'd probably find not only would most of us agree with it, uh, but it would be bipartisan. So I, I'm personally struck by how much uh, comedy there is here on, on this issue and how much overlapping set of you know, views and values we've seen today. So. I think your, your point's well taken. Congressman, this is, a, uh, this is a political body, and it should be. That's what it's set out, that's what its structure is, and it should be just, a, it should be a political body. When it is as um, evenly divided as it is now, it becomes particularly difficult, particularly in an election year. But the, the issue of how to structure and reform the, the ethical oversight responsibility is something that absolutely must not, if possible, it must not become a partisan issue for the simple reason that it is, it is, uh, it is destructive fundamentally of the relationships between the members and the ability of the body to operate on a, on a sound basis. Uh, it, is, it is so difficult when, it's, when we're in an election year and we are so evenly divided and 
each side wants to ensure on all the policy issues that they find ways to advantage themselves. At the same time, it, it, the ethics issue has got to be taken out of that equation. Uh, I don't know how to do that necessarily. I wish I did. But I cannot, I cannot stress more, have, more strongly that it, it must be taken, members must, and the leadership must lead on this, and the members must try to avoid the cheap shots, the one-upsmanships, and the, all the things that are possible within the ethics, within the structure of putting the ethics system back together the way it should be, is clear and is as easy to understand, as transparent as possible, uh, with good oversight, and in a bipartisan way, deal with the problems we have. And we have so few. We have a, we have a membership here of 435, and less than half a percent are, are, do we have problems. We don't have that many problems. But when we do, they have got to be dealt with without partisanship, because once partisanship becomes a question of ethics, we have a disaster on our hands. Mr. Hines, I, I certainly agree with you uh, completely. And we do, within this committee, uh, have the, uh, the power, the authority to do that. I mean, after all, uh, this is an original jurisdiction issue for the Rules Committee, uh, but we clearly will not be able to do it without uh, bipartisan support. And it's just as you've talked about and, and others of the witnesses have discussed here this morning, uh, it will not happen uh, if politics are allowed to uh, be the driver uh, in this ethics reform uh, because uh, it's not a corrupt body. Uh, there are those who have allowed themselves a very small number to, uh, to be corrupted. But I think uh, you and Mr. Frank both mentioned uh, uh, instances where it, you, in regard to the meal situation, uh, if you uh, fully disclose uh, and you're, you're taking too many uh, expensive meals and, and this, this is disclosed, pretty soon your constituents are going begin to begin to question that. Uh, uh, Mr. Frank had mentioned uh, the situation with the public policy committee at Pepperdine University and, and that trip. Uh, and the fact that the Ethics Committee said, now wait a minute, there's not, uh, uh, there's a little bit too much free time here. Uh, and so they went back and they fixed it. And, and that, that it, we, we clearly can do that. Uh, I'm not, uh, I hate to say that I, my optimism that at the end of the day we will do it the right way uh, and not the politically driven way uh, is a great concern to me and I, I'm afraid that that could really hurt the institution as well. Yes, sir. I apologize that I'm going to have to lean away from you in order to, uh, but I, I was invited here as an expert and so Well, I, I tell them to keep moving me, but you know, it's yes, <laughs> yes. Well, I'm, so I'm, far I'm, to no avail. I'm, 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 but but I, I just wanted to mention, I, I was invited here as an expert, and of course, sort of these partisan political issues are ones that I, I, I wouldn't uh, uh, profess to address here with this committee. I, I will say that um, having been asked about the history of the development of lobbying reform, uh, it is a, a reform process that has unquestionably influenced by, you know, perceptions within the political parties about the behavior of the other. The current rule structure was largely influenced by beliefs uh, by the majority, the now majority party when it was a minority, and of course Speaker Dinkwich was very much associated with this, that this was a corrupt institution and that the Democrats as a majority party uh, were somehow corrupt. Uh, I didn't believe that at the time. I'm a Democrat. I thought that was uh, a gross overstatement and a calumny against the party and, in the, and against the institution. But it's something that we find uh, that almost invariably when there are periods of scandal like this uh, become a factor that has to be addressed. Thank you all very much, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you very much. And I also want to thank each and every one of you for your time, for your effort. Um, you have been extremely helpful to this committee. Thank you very much. Thank you. The, uh, the chair notes that some members of the committee may have questions uh, that they uh, would like to submit to our witnesses in writing. Without objection, the hearing record will remain open for 30 days to permit members to submit written questions and to place those responses in the record. Without objection, the following written statements will also be placed in the record. 
Mr. John Graham, the American Society of Association Executives, Mr. Michael Petriccioni of the Consumer Electronics Association, and Mr. Jerry Clymer of the Congressional Institute and the Public Governance Institute. The hearing is hereby adjourned.